participants, um, 48, it's a good showing. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's see. So Marlene, did you have something that you wanted to say as an introduction or I? <laughs> well, um, again, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, and I wanted to note a couple of logistics Again, I just mentioned that I started the recording and a transcript for note taking purposes just um, to have later. Um, I also noticed in the chat that there's a, a link provided to the meeting webpage, um, and that's the place where we're going to try to be hosting um, some of the links to the content that people might be going through today. It'll also make sure that you have the Ring Central connection information handy um, should you get disconnected or we go on a break or lunch and we want to come back. Um, I think, you know, the, the usual standard role, and I'm really going to uh, pass it over to uh, the SSC chairs to call it to order and begin the workshop, but do be in touch uh, with me if you have any logistical uh, challenges or um, if something needs to be addressed. Um, I'm also taking attendance for those who are uh, part of council advisory bodies or are officially um, on a council team, um, just to make sure that that uh, attendance is noted for your participation. And I think that's everything on my end. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Marlene. So, yes, this is the pre assessment workshop for the 2023 ground fish stock assessments copper rockfish, canary rockfish, and black rockfish. Um, there will be a separate meeting held later for the remaining assessments for the cycle. Uh, this is a Bit of a kickoff in terms of participation of uh, the uh, management teams and uh, some of the uh, advisory bodies' uh, ability to provide input on the plans of the STAT and for the Groundfish Subcommittee members to engage um, in discussing some of those plans and provide some input and feedback. Um, so it's a really valuable opportunity. We started doing a few cycles back to provide a greater opportunity for dialogue and, and discussion and uh, addressing um, some of the considerations at hand that um, you know provide some input before the star panels rather than um, meeting some of these issues at the uh, star panel itself. So it gives a sneak preview as to what's being planned and how things are, are likely to be addressed and um, an opportunity for feedback. So everybody, um, this is a great opportunity and I hope everyone fully engage um, and uh, provide their input. Um, as far as uh, the agenda is concerned, we have here the uh, call to order, um, introductions and announcements. Um, Marlene just provided some announcements as far as the introductions are concerned. I think most of us are fairly uh, familiar with one another um, in the council process. There may be um, some opportunities for folks to introduce themselves when they speak, um, rather than going through the entire list of participants and introducing ourselves. Is that uh, it's, uh, you know, over 48 people uh, that would take some time. So we'll go ahead and, um, you know, as people have something to say, um, please introduce yourself and say your uh, affiliation before you speak, just so folks know um, who you are and where you're coming from and, and can uh, respond to your comments, etc. Um, so it'll help promote dialogue and a common understanding between assessment teams and data providers, best data and analytical and modeling approaches applicable to these assessments. Um, these pre-assessment workshops, uh, pre workshops provide that opportunity for the advisory panel members, uh, the management team members, stakeholders, and other and the ground fish subcommittee to comment on the proposed data and methods. Um, and this, any concerns or considerations identified here will be captured in the, by the chair of the uh, respective star panel uh, and uh, provided to the stat as a brief report uh, to provide a record of items to be addressed um, for the uh, star panel review. And um, those will be captured there and uh, that dialogue will help refine things uh, moving forward. 
As far as the rapporteurs, uh, each chair will record the notes for their respective assessments. Um, if that's, uh, I think that's a good way to do it so that folks are fully engaged and um, can speak to their own notes. And um, these uh, reports end up being three or four pages. So, uh, you know, the ad, it won't be ad nauseum detail. It will just be capturing the high points and considerations and points of discussion um, and some of the framework of the proposed model. Uh, as far as the agenda is concerned, um, I think this is a fairly simple uh, agenda just intended to um, capture the, the timing of the beginning and end of each of the respective um, star panel presentations for each of the species. Um, this is left pretty open due to the differences in the uh, progress made by respective star panel um, uh, stat groups because of the timing of those reviews. Um, different folks are going to be at different levels of progress, so we didn't launder list anything and left things fairly open. The public comment um, will be, uh, you know, we have one public comment scheduled for the end of the day, but in truth, uh, the intent is for this to be a somewhat of an open forum. So, um, you know, we'll offer those opportunities for public comment as a, a, a reminder uh, within each of these um, respective uh, star panel species kind of um, rubrics in the agenda. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be an open forum. So folks, please chime in as John Don't Bedrick, I think we may, oh. Are other people losing Hello. John Bedrick? <laughs> am I coming, am I uh, going in uh, and out? I am as well. Uh -oh, yeah, John, I think your um, Wi-Fi might be a little sporadic here. That is not good. Uh, how much of that did you miss? Hard for you to say, right? I just missed just a tiny bit of that. You're kind of going in and out, but you sort of come back in pretty shortly after you've okay. cut out. Is that true for everyone else? <laughs> I, I may have missed a little sufficient. longer. Yeah, so hopefully I was sufficiently intelligible. I apologize for the technical issues. Um, just to say, I mean, the 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 meat of this is in the discussions um, and the presentations from the, the start um, the stat teams. So, um, you know, I think uh, in any case, we'll arrive at the same product, uh, regardless of what's missed from what I had to say. Um, so I'll just keep it brief and say that, um, you know, the agenda um, has us going from 915 till noon for copper rockfish. And then um, we should have a, a break in between there somewhere. Um, we'll read the room and give a time for a rest. Um, Canary Rockfish will start at uh, 110 after lunch, and then we'll go through until um, that is complete uh, or public comment at 430. Um, I, I assume, you know, we will finish uh, before then, uh, but we'll, we'll take it as it comes. And uh, otherwise, tomorrow uh, we will meet at 9 a.m. and for Black Rockfish and uh, that will go until noon. And that's the general uh, agenda. Do the other uh, star panel chairs have any comments they'd like to add? That's um, Jason and John. No, I think you covered it pretty well, John. Uh, I plan on taking notes on copper and I will exchange that with you and John to make sure that that is what is the, what's the stat needs. And we'll go from there. Sounds good. Everybody is ready to go. So without further I, I lost John again. Yes, I think we did. So uh, without further ado, let's take it away, staff <laughs> team. All right, we'll just pass it over to Chantel or Melissa, whoever will be starting for copper this morning. Great, thanks Marlene. Uh, can you give me the ability to share my screen?
please? Yes. All right, uh, check now. Are you able to share? Okay, yep. I, it's now blue for me, so let's see here. All right. Can you see my screen, Marlene? Yeah, I can see your screen. And again, I'll note that if participants would like to go to the meeting webpage, um, there is a link to get to this uh, site um, if you would like to follow along there as well. Go ahead, thanks. Uh, great, thank you, Marlene. Um, and as John mentioned this morning, um, as we're going through material, feel free to raise your hand and ask questions if you know, you have questions about something we show or mentioned. Um, and, you know, I will start and then uh, we'll have uh, Julia and Melissa Monk take over. The stat team for Copper Rockfish Assessment in California are the three of us, Dr. Julia Coates at CDFNW, Dr. Melissa Monk at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and myself located at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, and all the material on this website are still preliminary. We're still working through the data, and I don't think we really have final data sets available for most items. So things might evolve between what we show today and you know, the June star panel. So keep that in mind. But hopefully this should get everyone a good idea of what we're looking at and how we're thinking about modeling copper this year. Um, so a quick overview. Copper was last assessed in 2021. Uh, it was assessed using a data moderate approach that only used uh, touch indices um, from fishery independent data sources and length data. Uh, the assessment estimated uh, two different stock status for the two modeled areas in California with the area north of Point Conception up to the Oregon-California border, estimated at 39% of unfished spawning output. Uh, the southern area, south of Point Conception in California, was estimated quite a bit lower at 18% of unfished. Um, and because of the results of these two areas, there was concern that given we did a data moderate approach and didn't use all potential data sources that we might want to have another look um, at this species in this area to make sure uh, that we have the best management of ice. So there were a handful of different uh, questions and concerns that were brought up in 2021. Uh, the data moderate assessment approach uh, does not typically estimate growth within the model. And so growth was fixed in both of the California models. And the growth in the area north of Point Conception, it was fixed at estimated growth from uh, the available age data in Oregon and Washington. Uh, in the south, it was estimated based upon uh, otolith and lengths collected by the Northwest Fishery Plants or Hooker Line and West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey. Um, however, there were still concerns that uh, we could do better to estimate length of age, uh, maturity, fecundity, all those important biological parameters for this portion of the species in California. And given that it was a data moderate assessment, um, some items were explicitly not included in the assessment. And so there was uh, quite a number of additional data sources that were considered, you know, that could be evaluated this year. Marlene? Um, just before you go too much further, is there a way for you to be able to uh, zoom in just a little bit on the Absolutely, content yeah. you're showing us? Thank you. I think that would be helpful. Thanks. Um, okay. Okay. Make sure I don't cut anything off. And yeah, if this is too small for your eyes, um, you can follow along um, on the website yourself or, or look at it later, close up. 
Um, and so some of the data sources that were identified were uh, historic onboard CPFP, blanks data, uh, the CCFRP survey, which we'll talk more about later. Um, and additionally, you, if we went to a full benchmark assessment, we could include fishery dependent indices of abundance where we could look at calculating index of abundance from the CPSC fleet um, and the rec side, uh, rec, recreational dock side sampling. Data could also be used to look at an index of abundance similar to what has been done in other nearshore assessments in California in the past. Um, additionally, you know, we're going to be looking at the ROV data that CDFNW collected across five years, ranging between 2014 and 2020. I might have the years off by one, but approximately in that, that year range. And then also we're going to look at any available age data so we could try to estimate growth within the assessment model. And estimating growth within the assessment model allows us an additional opportunity to uh, capture uncertainty. And so we are looking at a fleet structure that's going to be a bit different from the 2021 assessments. Uh, we are looking at retaining the same model area. So once again, having two models split at uh, point conception. And the reasons driving that decision is the, really the distinct differences in the fisheries north and south of point conception in California and uh, distinct differences in the data. And we'll show some of those um, patterns by area later on. And so there's, we're planning on having four fishing fleets in the model, and we're trying to retain the same kind of fleet structure for both model areas, which hopefully will make it easier for us to keep track of things and for others who are reading and reviewing the assessment to understand, you know, what is happening in each area. So the first, uh, rec uh, the first fleet would be a CPSE fleet of recreational fisheries. The second one is then breaking out that recreational private and rental vessel mode. Uh, and the reason why we're splitting those are differences in the data, but also the ability to calculate separate indices for each of those recreational modes. And then finally, there will be two uh, commercial fishing fleets, one looking at uh, fish being landed dead and the other uh, fish being landed live. Uh, there's a pretty distinct difference in the sizes being observed, being landed live and dead. And so allowing us to split that out into two fleets will help us better estimate a selectivity curve that's reflective of those differences in the commercial fishery. And then each model is anticipated to at least have one survey. Uh, south of Point Conception, there will be a survey fleet for the Northwest Fisheries Site Center Hook and Line survey. Uh, and then in the north, there'll be a CCFRP survey, and then we will additionally try to have one as well in the south for the CCFRP. So potentially five to six total fleets in the model. All right, so I'm gonna move on to removal data. First starting with commercial landings. Uh, commercial landings are primarily from hook and line gear across both areas where, there we go, so we get the whole figure on here. So on the top panel, we have removals north of Point Conception. On the bottom panel, we have removals from south of Point Conception. Uh, along the x-axis, we have year, 
And then on the Y axis, we have total landings. And we've broken out the landings by live and dead fish. And so the historical landings have been typically greater north of Point Conception. Um, they've been relatively similar in recent years among the areas. And we can see in the mid 90s that uh, creation of the live fish fishery, where quite a bit of the landings currently are going, uh, are being landed live. Yeah, and just looking at the gear types, uh, the majority of these catches, like I said, are coming from hook and line gear. Uh, south of Point Deception, that's essentially 96% of the total landings across time. Um, in the north, it's a little lower at 87%. And so any of the landings from different gear types will most likely go into the dead fish fishery, assuming they're being landed dead. Um, the one exception would be um, some minimal landings of live fish from pot gear, and that's primarily occurring in the north. And so kind of looking at the pattern across time, so here we have the proportion of fish being landed dead by year, and for each area where the north is the solid line with the blue circles, and the south is shown in the dashed line with the uh, triangles. So the proportion of fish being landed dead uh, is a bit higher, or a bit higher in south of Point Conception, where we have a higher proportion of fish being landed live uh, north of Point Conception in recent years across you know, last 10 years or so. And then looking at the data by gear type, uh, we are trying to understand patterns in the data across time. Let's make that a little bigger. Um, so on the left panel, we have north of point section. On the right panel, we have south of point section. And the landings have been grouped into these different gear groupings. We've got a hook and line, and then a combination of uh, miscellaneous, or let me see, diving gear, net, bottom trawl, shrimp trawl combined. And then pots broken out, and then trawls broken out as well. And what we can see here, across the different time blocks, the landings are grouped in these 10-year periods that north of Point Conception in the 80s, there were a decent amount of landings from coming from trawl gear. Um, that's really diminished across time with, in recent years, pretty much all the copper landings coming from hook and line gear. And then looking a little further into the gear types by uh, ports, so we've got the same information here as landings, but now it's being plotted by uh, subregion code. So this is all the landings across the entire pack fin period, so 1981 plus, that here looking at the yellow trawl gear, we can see that historically those 1980s trawls were primarily happening around San Francisco. But across all the other ports, you know, it's pretty much all hook and line gear. And, you know, the largest landings are coming from the Santa Barbara area and San Francisco. Chantel, can I jump in for a sec? Yeah. I was just going to, um, if anybody has any thoughts, we have not had a time to dive into whether or not those trawl catches in San Francisco are an artifact of the expansions process um, in PacFin and CalCom, or if those are real. So if anybody has any, for lack of a better word, heartburn about those trawl catches, please let us know, or let us know too, if you think that they are real catches. That's one thing we had a question about. 
Hey, Melissa. Yes, Gary. Yes, Gary. Yeah, I, I would. Is, is there any way to find out the associated uh, catch with those landings, those copper landings with that trawl here? Yes, yes there is. We have not had a chance to go back and dig into the raw data yet. Okay. But if, if we can get to take a look at that, I think we might be able to figure something out anyway. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yeah, as Melissa said, we've looked at what's impact been, and there's quite a number of different records of trawl gear landings, but it definitely could be an artifact of, you know, a composition sample having a large influence there that was not represented of what was actually being caught. So all the information we've shown so far today are landings. Uh, we have not um, looked at or made a decision on the, how we're going to estimate discard mortality, which would allow us to augment those landings to get total catch. Um, and some of the questions we had, you know, that we think we could learn from people familiar with the fisheries, you know, what do we think is the general pattern in discarding behavior across time? Uh, looking at the WICOP data, across all of the WICOP years, so that's roughly 2003 through 2021, there's about four, little over 4% of discards being calculated across California. Uh, the WICOP data isn't currently available to be split out south of Point Conception and north of Point Conception without a specific data request from that team, but we could definitely do that. And so, you know, we definitely have questions on, in the commercial fishery, is there different discarding, discar uh, discarding practices happening in the south versus the north? And then how does the current behavior uh, compared to historical, so pre pre 2000 or e even pre pre 1980, uh, about whether you know copper rockfish was really being landed any time it was caught, or if there was some level of discarding across time. And so I'll pause there if anyone wants to make any comments on that. Looks like everyone had just about the same thoughts as us as I don't know. Um, you know I think overall the team, we're assuming that discarding was probably low for copper in the past, but we're, we as a stat team will need to decide um, what discard rate to apply across time to make sure that we're representing the total mortality. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on to recreational landings and discards. Um, and for copper, really the main source of mortality is coming from the recreational side. Uh, and the fishery on the rec side is a little different north and south of Point Inception, where south of Point Inception, we have a slightly higher proportion of mortality coming from that CPFE fleet. About 42% of the landings are arising from that uh, mode where uh, the private sector is about 58% of the total landings. North of Point Conception, uh, the CPF Lee fleet contribution is a little lower at 34% of the total mortality versus the private at 66%. Uh, and the shore side is essentially zero to negligible where only north of Point Conception, there was a fraction of percent of total landing since 1981 that were attributed to shoreside. And so any shoreside removals we're going to just put into that private fleet in our model. But like I said, they are very, very small relative to the other removals. And so in the data, there are a couple pieces that we're going to have 
to decide as a team. Uh, the first one is, scroll down to the figure, uh, you know, filling in removals for uh, the missing MRF shears. So once again, in this figure, uh, on the, we have north of point deception on the top panel, south of point deception on the bottom, uh, landing on the y-axis and years across the x-axis. And so the recreational removals have been larger historically north of point conception, you know, prior to, you know, the mid to early 90s. Uh, where the removals have been a bit more on the similar scale between both of the areas post mid 1990s. So we'll have to fill in those missing years and typically those stat teams historically have either averaged the removals observed in the year before and the year after. So that 1989 and 1993 rules that either average those or do a ramping of up and down catches or up and or down and up, depending upon that direction. Uh, either approach gives you essentially the same removals across that three year period. And so we'll have to fill in that. And then uh, for some reason, the 2004 removals are no longer on Rexin. Um, EJ has put in an inquiry into that to figure out where they where they went. Um, and essentially those missing 2004 removals are fairly low that based upon the data that was available in 2021, was about 15 metric tons north of point conception and you know just under 14 metric tons south of point conception. Um, and in these data, the removal totals for 2021 are probably not fully complete. Uh, this is due to the limited dockside sampling during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have put in a request to CDF and W for them to provide estimates of total copper rockfish mortality coming from the recreational fleet for these two years. And then uh, the 2022 data are not shown here because they were not quite available yet. Chantel. Overall, yeah. There's a question in the chat about the discard mortality oh. rates um, that the council oh, just right. approved in November. Um, so the question, oh, where I close it? The question is, oh, I lost it. Anyways, it was whether or not the discard mortality rates approved by the council would be applied to the recreational catches. The answer is yes, CDFW is currently working on uh, program programming that into their system for the uh, surf estimates, um, and those will be applied back through 2022 recreational catches. So we will have those. Uh, those are gonna take some additional time, but to make sure that we have the most appropriate estimates uh, CDFW will provide the 2022 catches, I think, by March 30, 13th or 31st is what we decided as a stat team. Yeah. 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 I don't see that question in the chat. So thank you for grabbing that, Melissa. Yeah. And these removals are, uh, if not exactly or practically the same as what was used in the 2021 assessment. There really hasn't been um, large revisions to the historical data. And so, you know, most of the action will probably occur in these last three years. I see a hand up, I think. Yes. Hi, Chantel. John Butter. Hi, John. Um, hi. The, uh, I see this, uh, there's a little bit of a spike there. I think it's 19. 80 or so in the north? Is that? It's 80, 82. Or 82. 81, okay. sorry. 81. 81. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, mm -hmm. some of those early years for MRFs are a little bit, um, some of the estimates are a little wonky. Um, 1980 was one I think uh, we ended up uh, removing for Canary. I don't know about 81, 82, but anyhow, that, that spike just drew my attention. I couldn't tell exactly what year it was in, but for Canary, we actually ended up 
removing the 1980 estimate, but that's why I ask whether that was 80. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And uh, based on what I've heard in the past, uh, the 1980 MERS estimate are not used. And instead we use uh, the historical reconstruction from CALCOM provided by EJ Dick. And so that mm -hmm. is what we did here that if we had used the MRF 1980 data, it was similar to that spike we're seeing in 1981, but I think it was even a bit higher. And so, yeah, so 81 is that first year of MRF data we do, or we don't have anything else to turn to. Um, if CDFW is concerned about that data year, we would just request a revised number and we'll use whatever you guys think it's most appropriate. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and scroll down a little further. Um, and so similar to what I looked at in the commercial catch, kind of looking at the catch by mode type and the recreational fishery by uh, landing port area. Here, so starting on the left, we have, we're moving south to north across California, uh, where the highest recreational landings are coming in that channel, and I spelled channel wrong, uh, Channel Islands area. And that kind of aligns to where we often see copper in the Hook of Mine survey. So a lot of landings coming into that port in Southern California. Um, and then Northern California, uh, the landings are really tail off the further you go north, where they're highest kind of in the central and the Bay Area, but relatively low um, in the Wine District and the Redwood District. Um, and so similar to the commercial fishery, uh, we have not yet decided uh, what we're going to assume for discard mortality across time. And this would typically, in my mind, only apply to data prior to 1981, since the Rexin estimates provide estimates of, you know, catch and discard mortality. And so we would really only be thinking about what to do historically uh, I think the 2021 assessment assumed a very small discard rate of the older recreational data of a fraction of a percent. Um, and actually, I think it was supposed to be 3%, but I, <laughs> I, I did a smaller value by accident. Um, but essentially very small, very small discarding amount across time up, at, up through 1980. Um, and, and if anyone has any other thoughts on discarding practices in the recreational fishery, historically, we would be open to that feedback since that is definitely a decision point we're still working on as a team. Okay. I think uh, Melissa is gonna discuss the indices of abundance. Um, do we have any questions before I hand it over to Melissa? Or just keep going. Okay, I'm, I'll I'm scroll down, Melissa. Again. You just tell me. Yep, me neither. So you just tell me how to operate, and I will uh, do your bidding. Perfect. Thank you, Chantal. Uh, so, well, starting with the uh, fisheries independent data that are available for indices of abundance. Oh, we are going to consider the California uh, Co Collaborative Fisheries Research Program, CCFRP, which I think many of you have heard of thus far. Um, it is a collaborative program with the CPFV fleet and volunteer anglers to monitor California's network of marine protected areas that was established around 2007. From 2007 to 2016, CCFRP uh, was focused on the Central Coast. Uh, that was program was run by Cal Poly and uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs. And so you see that we have a longer time series for the Central Coast. And then in 2017, it expanded coastwide to include six universities uh, that are now monitoring several more uh, MPAs along the coast. 
And so it's a hook and line survey. Uh, they're using uh, two hooks per line. And we're using, we've used these data um, in two stock assessments previously as indices of abundance. Uh, we have also some age data to go along with the assessment this year uh, for copper rockfish. And so you can see that the copper rockfish, they've been found in every, they've been encountered in every single one of the MPAs, but not as common in some versus others. So we haven't taken a deep dive uh, with in CCFRP data for copper rockfish yet, um, except that you will note that at Carrington Point uh, in Southern California, there's a high proportion of copper rockfish. And you'll see those links there. They've seen over since 2017, I think it's over 2000 almost copper rockfish encountered at Carrington Point. And so there's really two sites in Southern California MPAs that have observed copper rockfish, the Carrington Point MPA, and then Anacapa Island. And so I don't know if there's enough data within Swamis and South La Jolla to consider those within an assessment uh, that's going to take a deeper look uh, at the data itself uh, and the spatial structure of that data to see how much area it's covering in the Southern California bite uh, for copper rockfish. And then in the north, uh, we'll treat the data similarly to how we did for vermilion rockfish, which will um, allow us to basically weight the index by the area inside and outside of the MPAs for copper rockfish. Um, that's going to take a little bit more thought uh, for copper rockfish than maybe uh, vermilion rockfish or some other species that uh, are only found on strictly hard bottom. But I think it's going to be possible. So look forward to working with CCFRP and creating an index for copper rockfish, hopefully north and south of Conception. Uh, but we'll see what the data tells us. We will have enough otoliths, though, south of Point Conception, either way, that they will be included either in a ghost fleet. If the index is not included as a fleet, um, they will still be used to help us estimate growth. Oh, you want to scroll down, Chantel? So the next survey uh, that was used in the 2021 stock assessment for copper rockfish is the Northwest Fishery Science Center hook and line survey uh, that is strictly in the California bite. Uh, you can see from 2004 to 2021, they caught a total of a little over a thousand copper rockfish. The majority of, the, of these are inside are outside of the CCAs. So you can see the CCAs here on the, on the plot here. And these are total copper rockfish counts by site um, on this map. And so you can see in the deeper waters, they're not really not seeing copper rockfish um, much deeper than about 75 to 100 fathoms max. So again, we haven't had a chance to look into this data in detail again for copper rockfish and make some other modeling decisions. Uh, but you can see the Northern Channel Islands really are a hot spot right here for copper rockfish, which is where we're seeing them in the CCFRP data and the catch data as well. Thank you, Chantel. I'm trying to circle as you are too, but <laughs> it's your mouth moving, not mine on the screen. Um, and so we are gonna look at this data. We don't have the 2022 data yet, and we will have all of the ages uh, for copper rockfish from this survey. Um, so I think that should be a little over a thousand copper rockfish to go uh, to match this survey in this stock assessment. Um, I'll just note that I think you have a you have a hand up. Oh, I can't see those. Okay, uh, Wayne, I believe. Yeah. Hey, Melissa. This is Wayne Cotto, CC uh, A California. Question for you: Do do you know the limitations of that CCFRP data, and the, and the methodologies they're using for their assess or for their uh, study? Yes, very well. Do you have a question, or are you asking if I'm aware of that? No, I just want to make sure because I mean they're using they're using five O and seven O hooks, you know, two hook ganyons, uh, shrimp fly, sh uh, squid baited on both, and then uh, swim baits, but you know, it, it's going to catch what it's going to catch, but it's not going to catch everything, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because of the limitations they're applying to us. So we're not catching all of the little fish necessarily. And the transects that they they put us through for their 50 minute uh, surveys are very, um, but part of it that we found out was like when we were doing the Channel Islands, uh, Anacapa area, you know, they had a method they were going through front side, back side, but time of day and weather and all that played such a factor on what you were gonna catch and when you were gonna catch it. 
So it was um, it was skewing a little bit of the data in the beginning for for that portion of the survey I know of because I was on those boats um, participating in the fishing. And then we asked them, okay, we'll change it around, uh, do the opposite um, method going backside, frontside. And it did change the catch, um, the types of catch and the quantities because of time of day and situation, right? Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that we know that there's limitations to the data. It's better than nothing, but um, it does have its limitations on, on catch. It does. And they are using different gear in Southern California versus Northern California. Um, additionally, yes, those first couple years, especially when you're, we will remove, especially sites. I know a couple of the programs, um, like Bodega, the first year, there were some sites sampled that, you know, proved to really not be great sites for the survey. And so we're going to make sure we drop those. Uh, same for all the other ones, like uh, Moss Landing and Cal Poly, those first couple of years, it was sort of trying to figure out where best to sample if they had a site that they thought looked great. Um, this was before we had the, all the really awesome habitat maps we have now. Um, there's a learning curve to the survey. So we will take that into account and definitely for 2017 for those other programs, we will look to see if we see any outliers, especially. Um, the nice thing at CCFRP is they've recorded uh, swell and a whole bunch of other environmental variables. So we will look at those and then we will probably actually come back to the recreational fleet and you guys to discuss those, especially those folks who are on the vessels in Southern California to make sure we're capturing everything, especially if we decide to use the Southern California CCFRP data for an index of abundance. Okay, thank you. Because the other, I mean, the other thing with CCFRP, right, is they're only fishing out to about 120 feet. They're not, um, to make sure that they're reducing uh, any barotrauma effects. So there's a, there's a depth limitation there as well. Yes. Yeah, we do, we do that. And then we're using the descending devices as best we can. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases around Anacapa, the sea lines are very bad. So there's a problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, we're doing our best on that one. Yes, let's um, catch up later about CCFRP too, because I haven't had a chance to work with the vessels down there and the folks down there as much as up north. Okay, appreciate it. Any questions on the hook and line survey as well? And I know we, in some of our stakeholder discussions earlier, um, over the last couple of weeks, we, we talked about some of the limitations that we should be aware of for the hook and line survey as um, for copper rockfish. So all of that will be forthcoming and we will try and Make sure we communicate with everybody as we go through these processes and develop these indices to make sure we're representing the data um, in the most appropriate way. So here is a representation of the index of abundance that was included in the 2021 stock assessment uh, that used a generalized linear mix model. It was not a spatial model um, and it, it include fixed effects for year, site, and hook. So the hook number. Um, and also drop and angler random effects. So this represents what was used in the 2021 assessment. I don't know, depending on how we decide to model the data and the portion of the data we use for the hook and line survey, how much this will change, but we wanted to present this as what was used in the 2021 assessment today. The next, uh, Index of or abundance that we considered looking at was the West Coast, the NIMS Northwest Fishery Science Center West Coast Brownfish Bottom Trawl Survey. Uh, this is the coastwide survey. Bottom trawl uh, doesn't go shallower, I think 50 meters, I want to say, or 50 fathoms, 50 meters. Is it the white ship survey? 55 meters. 55 meters. Thank you, Chantel. Um, and so it doesn't hit the, the real near shore areas. There's not enough data in this, there's not enough presence of copper rockfish in this data set uh, to warrant an index. The sample sizes within a year are low. However, they do see coppers um, and we do have, I think the total including the 2022 data is gonna be about a thousand otoliths that are currently being aged. They will be included in what we call a ghost fleet in the assessment to inform growth. 
And the trawl survey does see a fairly wide range of size and age of copper rockfish. So we do have some of the younger one to three year olds available to inform growth from this survey, both north and south of Point Conception. So the additional data sources we're considering, whether it's for an index of abundance uh, for fishery independent data, or to inform other portions of the stock assessment that might just be growth uh, time at settlement, our SMURF data, which those um, are basically imitating uh, a kelp forest, uh, and they're sort of a trap basically for the juvenile rockfish, SMURF data. Jen Cassell has a long time series of SMURF data that we haven't had a chance to look at yet. And there's some other pieces of SMURF data up and down the coast that probably won't uh, inform an index of abundance, but may inform other pieces of the assessment, like I said, like time of settlement um, or minimum size uh, by month for some of these species, or for copper rockfish in this case. The Pisco is a kelp forest inside outside MPA uh, dive transect survey. They do see copper rockfish. We're not sure if there's enough data yet uh, to allow us to use it as an index of abundance, but that's one data set we're exploring. An additional one, uh, but so Pisco uh, is volunteer divers as well, but uh, mostly scientifically trained. Reef Check is more of a citizen science uh, dive survey of the kelp forest. They do not speciate anything under, I believe, 10 centimeters, but we are gonna look at that data and see if it can inform anything for the stock assessment. And then the fourth, fourth, fourth piece of data that will be considered um, is the CDFW ROV survey data, which uh, had one SSC review right before the pre-pandemic, right before the pandemic started. We did also investigate uh, the California publicly owned treatment works uh, trawl surveys. There were not enough copper rockfish in those to warrant uh, an index of abundance. Any questions on fisheries independent data or other sources that we should consider before moving to fishery dependent? I think there's some, John Field. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I have a recollection of chatting with Chantel and Jason Cope about the, the Cal Coffee data after the last assessment. Uh, my recollection is that the number of positive observations was only a few dozen, probably not enough to do anything with, but it might be at least putting a, like a bookmark or a placeholder in the assessment uh, for that information that uh, data sets been used for other assessments. With copper, they have to genetically ID the larva. So that's they haven't done that with all the samples, and that's one reason for the smaller number of positives. And they haven't been able to do that in data since. I think the data they did that for was 98 through 2013. Uh, nevertheless, if they do manage to go back and identify more larvae from more samples over a longer time period, my sense is it may have the potential to be a useful index in the future. So just getting a bookmark on what's there, um, it's a good idea. And I'll, I'll re-forward the email conversations that took place uh, between folks in 2021 to you uh, in order to get that in there. I don't think it's something you probably want to include in this assessment, but I do think just a little nod to it for the future would be helpful. Yes, definitely. Sorry, that didn't, this may not have been a completely exhaustive. I do, um, I did email uh, Bill Watson and Noel Bolin back in June of last year, and I have Andrew Thompson's paper and a footnote to include from them about the Terrapoda species uh, that have not all been genetically identified for all years for the assessment. But we'll make sure that gets in there. Um, I'm just checking the chat. Let's see. The sail drone data. There's a conversation about sail drone data, but I don't know anything about the sail drone data, but Chantal will reach out to the acoustics team. And that wasn't relate, related to the Hake survey. Are there any other hands up? Andre. Thanks, Melissa. <clears throat> Andre Klein, CDFW ground fish staff. Hey, I know I sent some of our historic data over to you um, 
late last week, but just flagging that, that the historic data is largely uh, from fishery independent from about 1978 to 93. So we've got about 190 samples from that, largely from the central coast. Thanks, Andre. Yes, I think we have that included in the composition data in the biology sections later on in this talk. So, oh, yeah, sorry no for kidding. jumping we again. It and we have not had a chance to go through it with a fine tooth comb yet, but we will definitely be looking at that later this week. I say, Marcy, Louis Zim, uh, Southern California. Fisherman, I had a talk with Dr. David Deemer last week, and uh, he said that they have some ROV work from 2009 that I might want to look at uh, corresponding to some of the video work I've been doing. So you might want to talk to Dr. David Deemer. I think he's at Southwest Fishery Center. Yes, thank you, Louie. I've had um, some quick chats with Kevin Steerhoff, who has run most of those ROV surveys, the, and I, I can't remember which species it is that they published and developed uh, estimates from, but A, I don't think anybody has counted coppers in those videos from the, I think this would be the same set you're talk, speaking to, um, and B, I think that person had since, who developed the code to create the estimates has since left Southwest. Um, and I don't think anybody has his code. So there are Thank definitely you. some other surveys we're looking at. Um, I did confirm that there are not enough copper rockfish in the 2012 submersible survey that was used for cow cod and vermilion. Um, and I think EJ Dick, I had asked him to check on a couple of the other video surveys that are available from our lab too. So we'll check with Dave Deamer and make sure we've got everything and Kevin Steerhoff that might be useful. Thank you. I can't, is there an easy place to see hands? I can't see them unless I scroll through all the names. I think the only hand is John Fields and it might be a lingering hand. Yep, he put it down. Okay, great. Let's move on to fisheries dependent data. I get my screen scrolled down to you. So the fisheries dependent data indices used in the copper assessment will be very similar to the ones that we've been using for many of the other nearshore stock assessments over the past couple of cycles. We will have uh, an index from the onboard CPFV observers. We will have an index from the private and rental mode fleet that are interviewed dockside. And then we will also look at both the links from those um, are part of SERFs already. And we will have a look at both the links of the retained and discarded uh, rockfish from the PC or the CPFE fleet. We are going to consider not using the indices um, past 2019 due to issues with the pandemic. Um, during the first bit of the COVID pandemic, the dockside samplers were not able to approach people and were not able to speciate the catch um, for those time periods. And in 2021, the recreational fleet has been actively avoiding copper rockfish, um, which has a possibility to introduce uh, new sets of biases and selectivity into those data sets. And we may only see a change in, we may see a change in the discard length composition that may not be reflective of what would be happening were there not a one fish sub bag limit and the recreational fleet were not actively avoiding and descending copper rockfish. I think that is it for the fisheries dependent data sets. 
We are using the CPFV logbook data um, that you'll see when Julia talks a little bit about the composition data to look at the general distribution and number of overnight versus single day trips in Southern California. But we are not planning to use, and we cannot use the, the CPFV logbook data to develop an index of abundance for copper rockfish. Twenty twenty two. So comment from iPhone. Oh, that's just in the. Got it. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments on indices of abundance? If not, I'm going to turn this over to Julia to talk about the composition data. Hi, everybody. So um, since this is my first cycle um, participating in STAT team, so I'll go ahead and turn on my camera for a sec and introduce myself. Um, I'm Julia Coates. I'm a specialist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm based in our Santa Barbara office. So I'm going to um, go through the composition data, starting with commercial. So in this plot, um, you see the number of length samples we have by year um, for the northern on the left and southern regions on the right, um, also separated by fish that are landed live or dead. Um, the majority of these samples are from hook and, the hook and line gear type. Um, and you can see that fish began to be landed live in the mid 90s, and we have pretty good representation in the samples from both condition types. Um, so, Chantel, if you want to keep going to the next plot. So, these are box plots um, that show the sizes among those samples by year, also separated by north and south, north on the top, south on the bottom panels, um, and live and dead, dead on the left and live on the right. Um, the line in each box represents the median size, um, and the boundaries of the box are the 25th and 75th percentiles. Um, so what we see here is that particularly in recent years in the north, um, fish landed live are smaller than those landed dead. Um, fish in the south also tend um, to be smaller overall than in the north. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it may be easier to see in the next plot. Um, Chantelle, if you want to keep going. So these are probability density curves for size um, in the north and south, north on the top, um, also with the separation of live and dead. Um, so the northern fish have a broader size distribution, um, expanding farther to the right into larger sizes um, than, than the southern fish. Um, and both the northern and southern fish show um, Fish of all sizes can be landed dead, but fish um, uh, landed live tend to be slightly smaller. So a little bit easier way to see that there. We can keep going to the next plot. So this breaks it down at a little bit finer geographic scale. So these again are box plots um, of sizes by port moving, um, moving north from left to right. Um, so Ventura on the left and then um, Crescent City on the right. So there's a lot of overlap in sizes among the ports. Um, you can see that Eureka and Crescent City stand out as having larger fish, um, those dead, that dead panel on the top. Um, Moss Landing also seems to have relatively larger fish in the live fishery, which is interesting. Um, so I'll just pause there before I move on to recreational length compositions and see if anyone has any questions or thoughts about that. I don't see any hands. I guess we'll keep going. So next we'll go through some recreational length comps. So this plot shows the number of length samples we have by year in the north and south, um, separated by the CPFV and private boat modes. 
Um, so this data is available on RecFin. Um, and additional um, historical data sets, like Andre mentioned, um, have been brought to our attention and we'll evaluate them um, and add them as appropriate. Um, but just from this data, you can see that in recent years, the northern recreational fishery has been dominated by um, private boaters and the opposite in the south, um, most of the samples coming from CPFB. So let's keep going. So similar to the plots that we showed for the commercial data, um, these are the recreational probability densities for size, um, separated by north and south and the two different modes, um, showing that there's a higher density of large fish in the north relative to the south. And the modes are generally overlapping. Um, with perhaps some larger fish from CPFBs in the north um, relative to private voters. Um, yeah, and we have relatively, I guess that's all I want to say about that. So let's keep going. Okay, so um, in Southern California, um, which as we mentioned in recent years, is dominated by the CPFV mode. Um, the trips are categorized by either being half day, three quarter to one day, or overnight. Um, and our surf samplers are unable to go on board overnight trips um, at as high a frequency as they um, are able to sample day trips. Um, so there's been a concern that this may lead to an underrepresentation of areas that are farther from port um, that can be reached by those overnight trips. Um, and those areas might be um, therefore more lightly fished and contain larger fish. Um, so these plots are histograms of the number of length samples um, uh, within different size bins or length bins. Um, in the two districts, um, District 1 is San Diego and Los Angeles and District, District 2 being more of the Santa Barbara area. Um, and they show that we do see fish from overnight trips in District 1. Um, are distri distributed within the larger range of sizes um, represented by the day trips. Um, so these plots aggregate data um, from 2012 to 2019. So let's go to the next plot. So to look at this issue a little more closely, we examined the catches of rockfish and other fish, um, non-rockfish, by year on multi-day and single-day trips. Um, and we saw that both rockfish and non-rockfish catches experienced a spike um, beginning in 2014 and remained fairly high for some time. Um, but we didn't see this spike um, in single-day trips. And in the next plot, um, you can see that the number of multi-day trips um, also increased at this time, it jumped up in 2014 and then um, continued to be fairly high. Um, and many of these trips listed tuna as their target species. Um, so we're concluding that um, the increase in rockfish catch um, from multi-day trips in 2014 is attributable to the arrival of warm water that drove an increase in trips targeting pelagic species but then also visited groundfish trips in the same, uh, I mean, groundfish sites in the same trip. Um, so if we can go to the next plot, um, looking more specifically at copper rockfish, um, this plot compares the percent of copper rockfish taken from multi-day trips, um, from the total multi and single day trips together. So the percent from multi-day trips um, that's the blue, um, with the percent of rock or copper rockfish length samples um, from multi-day trips, um, so in the orange there. So you can see we do, we are um, undersampling um, the multi-day trips, particularly since 2014. Um, so if we can go to the next plot. So we then explored the consequences um, of this sampling bias with a simple simulation experiment. 
Um, so in our data, um, we have a mean and standard deviation for lengths um, coming from multi versus single day trips. Um, so we can generate a, a, a dis distribution of sizes from those two different trip types. Um, we can then sim simulate a biased sample of a thousand lengths by sampling 980 lengths from at random from the distribution of um, sizes from single day trips and then take 20 lengths from the distribution of sizes from the multi-day trip lengths. So this split of 980 to 20 is based on the smallest proportion of samples coming from multi-day trips that we have in our actual data. Um, and then we simulate an unbiased sample of, again, 1,000 lengths by sampling 810 lengths from the single day trip um, distribution of sizes and 190 from the multi-day trip distribution. So um, we did that because between 2014 and 2018, 81% of the trips were single day trips. Um, so if we sampled them according to um, the number of um, actual trips that were made, um, that should be an unbiased sample. Um, so these curves um, compare the biased and unbiased samples um, in the sort of probability density of, of sizes that you would generate from those um, different sample types. And you can see that the difference in means is only a half centimeter greater um, for the unbiased sample. So since we intend to use two centimeter size bins in the assessment, um, we feel that this bias is um, unlikely to have a measurable impact on the CPFB fleet length compositions. So I will pause there, see if anybody has questions. This is Louis Zim. I do have a question or a point. If you look at the curves half day trips, which fish very much local, you've only got four and a half hours to run, versus the day trips, you'll see the different. And when I point out the day trips, I'm specifically pointing out trips from Santa Barbara that uh, day trip can access up close to Point Conception and then also over to Santa Rosa Island. And you see they're quite different. So uh, I would ask that you do the same analysis that you just did with half day trips versus day trips and multi day trips, or just half day versus day trips, you may see something significant there. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Louis, this is Melissa. I looked at that a little bit yesterday um, in the length composition, and yes, the half day trips do see smaller. Copper rockfish. Um, one thing that we can consider going forward in the assessment is to weight the length compositions by the proportion of those trips taken. That's going to take a little bit more thought and effort, um, but it's something that we are considering. And I do appreciate that, Melissa. This is a discussion that we had um, the winter of 20 and 21 when. The original assessment was trying to uh, source data. Thank you. All right. I don't see any other hands. Um, so we can move on, I think, to. Um, length and a little bit of discussion of age um, from the surveys. So um, these are probability density plus for links um, inside and outside MPAs for some northern and southern sites from the California Collaborative Fisheries Research Program or CCFRP. Um, so an initial look um, indicates that we do see larger fish um, inside MPAs. Um, from uh, sites south of San Francisco. Uh, and I think Melissa mentioned earlier, um, this is something we might um, uh, consider in the, in the development of the index of abundance using this data. Was there anything else, Melissa, you wanted to say about that data? 
No, I don't think so. Okay, great. So let's go to the next plot. All right, so these are the Northwest Fishery Science Center hook and line survey um, data. Um, it's been going on since 2004 in Southern California. Um, 1,151 copper rockfish have been caught and aged over that time, um, with most of those samples coming from outside the CCA. That's the split in um, colors you see there. Um, and of course, this is a um, histogram of sizes. So we can move to the next plot. So this is just showing um, uh, the lengths across different depths from that data. Um, so samples have been collected across a range of depths um, with a mean of 44 fathoms. And males and females are the different colors here, and they appear to be well represented across the different depths. So let's move to the next plot. This data is the Northwest Fisheries Science Center West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey, um, which has collected copper rockfish lengths and ages um, since 2003 in both northern and southern regions, um, with most fish having been sexed um, and a pretty even split between males and females, the north and south. Um, uh, north on the top, south on the bottom, and the different colors being the sexes. Um, so we intend to use these ages um, in the model, um, which will represent new information relative to the previous data moderate assessment. Um, the hook and line survey and the CCFRP ages will be entered um, associated with their own survey fleets. Um, to potentially inform growth, age structure, and recruitment. Um, however, we don't plan on using a survey fleet for the West Coast um, Roundfish Bottom Trawl Survey because of limited observations. Um, so these will be entered as what's called a ghost fleet and allowed to inform only growth. Um, so that is all I had to share um, with regard to compositions. So we can pause for questions before going on to biology. I don't see any hands. Melissa, were you going to um, cover the biology? Yes, I can cover the biology. Great, thanks. So in terms of maturing fecundity, um, we are currently undertaking uh, a field season right now, uh, going out this Friday for the first time to try and collect copper rockfish in order to update estimates of maturity and fecundity along the entire California coast. This is going to hopefully let us update the maturity odives that you see here from the 2021 stock assessment that borrowed some data from Oregon and Washington. Those will be finished hopefully we will hopefully have enough samples by April um, counted. Staff are standing by waiting to start counting copper rockfish eggs so that we can get these estimates in time for the assessment. And we have other sources of data we can use for maturity as well that we will pull everything together um, north and south of conception. And then you can see below the estimated fecundity at length used in the 2020 assessment. Um, from EJ's meta-analysis for copper. So we will compare this with the estimates that we get from the current sampling. The length-weight relationship uh, was estimated using all of the biological data 
from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center bottom trawl survey and the hook and line surveys. We don't expect this to change much. We'll add the data that were collected um, within the most recent years to this curve, uh, but we don't typically see latitudinal differences in weight at length. For the length at age, this is where we're going to see the most significant uh, portion of new biological data as well. For a copper rockfish, we have several new sources of data, well, new quote unquote new data sources for copper rockfish. So north of conception, we estimate that we're gonna have 1,284 copper rockfish aged for the assessment and over 2,000 for south of conception. So some of these data sources are, we ha we'll have 211 uh, copper rockfish from the cooperative sampling that we did with the CPFB fleet uh, this year. And those are all, the North of Conception ones will be from uh, the Bay Area in Santa Cruz. CDFW was able to collect 99 copper rockfish otoliths from the private and rental vessels uh, in Northern California. We have 79 otoliths from the commercial fleet, around 87 from CCFRP to hopefully match with that index of abundance. There's 423 from a research survey conducted by Don Pearson. We have 195 from the trawl survey and 190 from the historic collections from the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and those are the ones that Andre referenced earlier. So south of Point Inception, we have almost 500 from the cooperative CPFE collections. Uh, only nine from the commercial fishery, so those will likely not be included in the assessment linked to the commercial fleet. Over a thousand from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center hook and line survey. Over 500 from the trawl survey. We have 52 from CCFRP from this year from Santa Barbara um, that they were able to collect. And then the other two universities, um, the other university in Southern, two in Southern California did not um, see copper rockfish. And we have 34 from a research survey conducted by Don Pearson um, that was the same as that in Northern California and a few samples from Southern. We also have some additional samples, about 300 otoliths that we need to link back to data from North or South Conception from 1978, 81, and 84. I believe that these were already, these were already aged uh, by the Northwest Fisheries Science Center for the 2021 assessment um, during the September meeting but we have not had a chance to go back and relink these to the data yet. So that is on a to-do list. These, we are hoping that every single otolith available for copper rockfish, we are most positive they will all be aged and a subset of those will be cross-read um, by the cap lab. For natural mortality um, was fixed in the 2021 assessment, a value of point. 108 per year based on the assumed maximum age of 50 years. Uh, this will, the input parameter for natural mortality for the 2023 assessment will be reconsidered after we receive all of these age estimates um, if it looks like copper rockfish are living longer than 50 years or an average of 50 years. And with that, I believe that is all of the information we have to present today. Great. Thank you, Melissa. And thanks to Chantel and Julia as well. Um, I was able to get myself onto the web based uh, version of Ring Central. So, fingers crossed, no more glitches on my end. Um, okay. So, uh, did the chair uh, of this star panel have any additional questions or anything more to? Uh, discuss relative to the presentation. Any clarifications, etc., for your notes? I don't believe so. I've got several pages of notes, and I recorded some requests from some of the advisors, but I didn't have anything additional myself. Okay, great. And did we have any public comment? on this presentation or for copper rockfish, both north and south of Point Conception. I think folks uh, chimed in as we went along, but I just wanted to give uh, a last opportunity 
Um, it's now 20, hey, 10, John, 27, eight. John. Yes. Corey. Yeah, I raised my hand. Sorry about that. Um, and I can wait if you, if you're about to call break there. <laughs> I did have a question about the, uh, and, and I, I think I, I read the, the document here, um, but on, on the, the stock areas, I don't know Chantel or, or and stats. Um, I didn't, I, I must, I might've missed what you said, but you're, you're treating, you're keeping the same. Well, first of all, thank you all for, um, doing the assessment this way, uh, California only. I know it was a bit of an ask um, from the council, given the circumstances. I know you all prefer to be looking at, at all areas together, including Oregon and Washington. So I wanted to express appreciation for, for doing it this way. Um, so yeah, I guess I was wondering if you could talk, if you had any thoughts. It sounds like you're doing the assessment um, in, in the same, you know, Southern California, Northern area. Um, way that you did last time because there's advantages for um you know for for the data and for the signal you think you're gonna have the assessment but did you do you have additional thoughts on on you know the how connected those two areas are are you are remaining agnostic um to that question as, as part of this larger stock definition um matter the council's taking up and a second but somewhat related question um these these uh, the species goes down into Baja, as I understand it, and was wondering if you had any thoughts about 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 that. I'll stop there. See if I'm making any sense. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious how you how you're thinking about this in terms of that um, the broader stock definition discussion we're having at the council. Hearing crickets, I'll chime in. This is Melissa. Um, we are remaining agnostic as of now. The two areas, north and south of Conception, as, a, as most folks understand, have very different uh, fleets, fishing pressure histories, um, catch histories, et cetera. We don't know a lot about dispersal of copper rockfish um, north and south of Conception. We are undertaking a project to look at the genetics of copper rockfish that I don't know if we'll have in time for next spring, but it's a possibility. We are going to collect uh, fin clips from all the fish we're collecting as part of this study uh, for fecundity maturity, which will give us a good description of the California stock at least, and then we'll work on collaborating with others to get fin clips from Oregon and Washington as well uh, to make sure they're included in the analysis. As well, we've um, talked with Louis and uh, Ken Frankie and folks in the South about the portion of the stock that they might hypothesize is in Mexico. The answer is yes, there are copper rockfish in Mexico down through Baja. Um, we don't know a lot about them. We don't have any research on those fish in Mexico, in Mexican waters. Um, we can look at some of the historical data to see what portion of the, especially the recreational fish, may be coming from Mexico. But that's not something that we're prepared to undertake now. But there are future opportunities to possibly sample rockfish species from Mexican waters that will give us a glimpse into what's happening there. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Melissa. Uh, the in the chat, we have a question from Sabrina Bear. Um, I, is this any indication that uh, natural mortality may be different north and south? Any evidence of older fish in the north? Probably hard to estimate. Um, any any examination of that question about the mortality north and south, natural mortality? This is we will not. I'll go ahead. <laughs> I figured I'd take one since you did the last heavy one. Um, there is limited information on how natural mortality may change across our coast. Uh, that maximum age of 50 was used in the last assessment based upon uh, the maximum age we had in available age data in Oregon and Washington, which was around you know, 50 and a few fish a little bit older than that. And that actually really aligned well with um, some information provided by Milton Love in one of his many rockfish books 
that estimated maximum age for copper around 50. And you know, Milton does a lot of his work in California. And so hopefully that, that means there might be some consistency across the coast, but we'll definitely be reevaluating that based upon all the age data we, we now have. Great, thanks Chantel. All right, and uh, yeah, Gary Richter just had a quick clarification uh, just for others' edification uh, regarding the Pearson Research Survey and um, where that was operating, and John Field clarified that it was operating uh, mostly on the shelf, but uh, also in the near shore and slope, and uh, had some further uh, elaborations on the geographic distribution and timing of the sur survey and samples in the uh, chat if anybody's interested. Uh, I think that was pretty well resolved, so. Um, don't think there's any hanging chads there for the uh, star panel chair to capture, but just wanted to make folks aware of that in the chat. So it is now uh, 1033. Um, oh, we have one hand up from Marcy Remco. Thank, Go ahead. Thank you, John. Marcy Remco with CDFW. Um, back near the very top of the presentation and in the report, the, discre the discussion on fleet structure, um, did I hear you mention that there was potentially some room for adjustment in the fleet structure that's being considered? Did I hear you say that potentially there were, you were still considering the possibility of adding additional fleets? I thought, I, I know the ghost fleet mentioned, but were there others? Hey, Marcy, this is Melissa. So there, there will be fleets for these surveys. We didn't include um, those here. So there will be a fleet for the Harms Hook and Line survey, for the CCFRP survey, and others. But in terms of the fisheries, these are the four fleets that we are considering. Okay, got it. Thank you. And there is, like, I, I think we discussed in one of our meetings, there in terms of stock synthesis, we want to keep the models consistent across areas so that we have fleets with the same numbering and names across areas. And within stock synthesis, we can actually mirror the selectivities or combine the catches from these if we decide that in one of the areas that these really weren't just one fleet for the recreational or commercial. Meaning you have the ability to lump as warranted. Yes, it is easier to lump than split. Got it. Okay, thank you so much. All right, do we have any additional questions or comments um, from the public or anyone else? Okay. Not seeing any hands. And uh, as I noted earlier, it's it's ten thirty five. Um, at this point, I think uh, it probably is wise to break until uh, we reconvene for copper rockfishes. Some folks may not be planning to jump on the call until one o'clock uh, when we would be covering uh, those species, uh, the copper rockfish. Uh, sorry, canary rockfish, which uh, is of interest to folks in 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 Oregon and Washington as well as California. Um, so rather than persevere, I think it's best to reconvene. Um, and uh, we have one comment just on the fly uh, from Mark uh, Terwilliger, uh, just to mention in terms of ages, we at ODFW just had our paper on validating ages in Oregon Blacks, Coppers, and Cabazon accepted for publication. So something perhaps for the stat to take a look at. Um, all right, so uh, just say, I think um, from here, if uh, Jason has everything he needs, um, just get a confirmation there. And then I think we will go ahead and uh, start our, an extra long lunch. <laughs> we'll, we'll go ahead and break until uh, we come back for uh, Canary Rockfish at, uh, at 1 10 PM. I am good with that, John. Thank you. Okay. Well, all right, everybody. Let's, we'll see you again at 110. Thanks, John.
not talking, please have yourself on mute. And um, yeah, so we scheduled to reconvene at one um, and to begin discussions on canary rockfish at uh, one ten. Uh, in the meantime, uh, just a couple of words on uh, the next uh, pre-assessment workshops after tomorrow, um, since there are a couple of species that we're not going over uh, today and tomorrow. Um, we have uh, short spine thorny heads and Rexol also to discuss at a later date, which, and Marlene, uh, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is now the uh, date that's reserved, it's March 15th, uh, 1 to 5 p.m., that's a Wednesday. Okay. 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 All right. So we can put that on your calendars uh, so that we get as much attendance as possible for that meeting. It's March 20th, 1 to 5 p.m. Maybe some reminders sent out, etc. As the time approaches, but please plan accordingly. I'd like to get as much participation in that as possible. Uh, just a couple of updates on the dates of the star panels. We already discussed copper rockfish today, and that uh, star panel will be held on June 5th through 9th. And uh, that's scheduled either for the council office or Seattle. And Jason Schaffler will be the chair for that meeting. And uh, we'll, of course, be uh, talking about black rockfish tomorrow. And that uh, is the second star panel. We'll take up that whole star panel, and that will be July 10th through 14th. Uh, just to plug that meeting. Uh, and then for the third and final star panel uh, for Petroli Soul and Canary Rockfish, that will be held on uh, July 24th through 28th. So everybody is aware, and that will be chaired by John Field. Um, and I'll be chairing the Black Rockfish uh, star panel. All right, since we're kind of killing a little time there in the interim for the Canary Rockfish uh, presentation, uh, does anybody else have any updates Marlene, anything uh, further on upcoming meetings? Yes. Yes. We're not entirely sure where yet. We're trying to see if we can schedule it in our auditorium as we've had many before. But we have new security procedures we're dealing with, so uh, we'll have to uh, get back to people on that for both. And Black Rockfish, we're looking at Santa Cruz. We also have the council office on the list as well, but I think some of the leanings were Santa Cruz. Go ahead, Melissa. Hey, Marlene. So oh, I was gonna. I had heard that copper rockfish would be in Seattle. Is it Seattle or Portland, or has there been a decision made? Jim yeah, just permitting that on Seattle too. Okay, so there's been some more conclusion there. I was I was referencing the uh, future meeting planning from the SSC statement from November. Uh, but yeah, um, if there's been some progress in deciding between those, that's good to know. Sounds like Seattle's the preference. Okay, any other announcements?
Yeah, and so for those uh, folks on the management team will be participating in the advisory bodies, of course, the best reference there is the terms of reference for an indication of the roles and responsibilities of the participants and the expectations there. Um, feel free to ping on myself or Marlene if you have questions about that and uh, more of the specifics. Um, other than that, uh, we also have the accepted practices that will be reviewed at the March Council meeting and approved. We've already reviewed those. Uh, as a group of the SSC and staff members, et cetera. Um, but we will finalize that um, and codify it uh, in March uh, for further reference. It's been available in its near final form uh, for some time now, but that's where it will uh, daylight in the council process itself. Another good reference for the assessment teams, they're well aware and contributed to its uh, revision. So I think everybody's aware that needs to be aware. And I'm looking at uh, 109, and I think we can go ahead and <coughs> venture forward with a Canary Rockfish presentation. I think most of the folks who are interested in being here will be here. So, um, and it's 110. So, um, with that, we can go ahead and have uh, Brian Langseth and Kiva Oaken uh, provide their presentation. And, um, have some ancillary staff members as well from the states. I'll let them speak too. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, I will present for the first probably two thirds, and then I think it might be easier to switch that up to Kiva and let her share her screen after I'm done. Okay, I see it. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you all. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Langseth, and I am one of the NOAA stat team members. The second, as John mentioned, is Kiva Oaken. Our various state partners for this uh, assessment are Allie Whitman from Oregon, Teresa Tsu and Kristen Hinton from Washington and John Budrick from California. This presentation is divided into sections and they are signposted throughout with these slides. Each section also is organized with some uh, a general overview slide and then at the end includes any questions that I will have asked along the way. With that said, I welcome any interruptions uh, for questions or topics that I say. I've asked Kiva to, to flag anyone with hands raised or comments in the chat box. Uh, John Field as star panel chair, you're also welcome to interject. Uh, if you see comments or hands raised as well. Uh, with that, I guess I should ask John Field, are you uh, taking notes and present? Copy that, Brian. I am indeed. Perfect. Thank you for that. This work, just like the one for copper, is preliminary. We are going to be showing data that may or may not be finalized. Um, this is initial work to uh, ensure that we're making good choices as best we're able to, and also getting input and feedback from people who are closer to the data and more knowledgeable than we are on the intricacies of that data. So I thank you all for attending this. It helps us and having this discussion is valuable. So the basic overview uh, this first section will we'll just summarize some of the biology in general, as well as our structure, plan structure for our assessment. A brief background on canary biology, canary rockfish range from California to Alaska, but really kind of north of Point Conception, southern to mid-California. 
There are schooling semi-pelagic species that'll come up in some of the trawl data that Kiva shows or, or survey data that Kiva shows. There are shelf species that exhibits ontogenetic movement. So younger fish tend to be shallower, older fish tend to move offshore. There's no observed genetic differentiation along the U.S. West Coast. And then they are decently long lived uh, up to 84 years in the literature and that was used as the max age in the last assessment. The assessment history for canary rockfish is extensive. <laughs> they were first assessed in 1984 with full assessments uh, in many years. I won't list them here. Uh, there were updates in 2009 and 2010, and then catch-only projections in the recent two-year cycles. Full assessments, I'll get to a little bit more detail, just open up um, more data to explore revisiting assumptions. Updates tend to match what was done in the most previous full assessment. Canary rockfish was declared overfished in 2000, but declared rebuilt in 2015. Just a brief history of some structural choices uh, among the recent full assessments. The 1999 model used two separate models, uh, modeling the north and south of INPFC areas. The 2002 model combined those and used a single coastwide model. 2005 used that but applied regional specific fleet structure, so modeling each fleet separately, um, a mix of state and regions for that assessment. And then the 2015 assessment added some population structure. For this assessment, our general plan, uh, we plan to model this in stock census as three. Uh, this is a very common modeling framework in this region. Uh, the model will be a coastwide model within the US. Uh, this is a benchmark, so full exploration of model assumptions and data. The data types are shown here, uh, standard ones, catch data, including discards and landings, length and age compositions. Our survey length and age compositions will be combined in conditional age at length compositions. Uh, a number of indices, biological data, um, some basic model parameters, fix some of our bi biological parameters, including steepness, estimate growth with the conditional age at length data from the survey. Uh, we'll explore uh, various assumptions on how to model mortality, which Kiva will get into, uh, and then mostly estimating recruitment deviations and selectivities by fleet with various blocks that we'll discuss later in this presentation. The first, these next couple slides talk about our planned assessment structure. As I mentioned, the last full assessment was spatially structured. Uh, although it was one coastwide model with one stock recruitment relationship and uh, common biological relationships, there was spatial structure in fleets by state and spatial structure in the population by these distribution deeps, which are really apportioning recruitment to the various areas. Um, that apportionment is informed by comp data and the survey data. There was no tagging or movement data to inform that, and it was assumed that no movement of adults, so strictly movement in the recruitment. For this model, we plan to explore simplifying that structure from the 2015 model. Uh, this is based on a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is in the previous assessment, they ran a number of sensitivities simplifying this spatial structure. Uh, those sensitivities are shown here. Um, generally very similar across reducing the recruitment apportionment component, uh, including reducing the spatial fleet component and then also uh, this fourth, or I guess third selective sensitivity of minimizing selectivity blocks. Across those lines are fairly similar. Um, so in some regards, the added complexity from the spatial structuring 
uh, does not have a huge effect on model results. The second reason for at least exploring this is based on some recent results by Cole Monahan. Um, they looked at the canary model and uh, developed it is a Bayesian model. Um, the details I won't get into, but this allows them to um, sample the parameter space more extensively. Um, and what they found here in quotes, the biggest culprit, um, Canary Rockfish had very long run times for this. The biggest culprit was over parameterization. So uh, trying to look at in general, uh, simplifying uh, some of these choices and complexity for this round. That analysis also revealed that there are many combinations of parameters that can result in similar results, thus contributing to the long run time. They, in their paper, uh, eliminated that spatial recruitment component and then simplified the structural activity. By doing that, they ran it against the original model and found very little change in overall model estimates, much like the 2015 uh, assessment found in their sensitivity runs. Oh, that's just that again. So in light of these, we plan to do something similar. Look at exploring how excluding recruitment apportionment uh, and that spatial structure in the population may influence results. Uh, we would plan to keep the fleet spatial structure. Uh, also fixing some of the selectivity parameters um, to free up or to to um, allow the model not to be freely parameterized over all those parameters, presumably getting those estimations to be a bit more stable. With those changes in mind, um, our fleet structure then will be a bit simpler. Um, looking at five to 15 fleets, depending on the number of areas. Um, those are shown here and we'll go into more detail with those. Um, also looking at uh, revisiting indices choices. Um, the ground fish survey is the big one that will include uh, the triennial survey. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Kiva will in the survey portion of this talk. Uh, incorporating the pre-assessment survey and then um, also looking at potentially including more state-based surveys. As was done in the previous assessment, we'll incorporate discards and landings. Our plan is to add them together. Uh, we're modeling canary rockfish as a two-sex model. There is dimorphic growth between males and females, uh, and then include compositions with selectivity blocks. So that is the basic structure. Uh, I will stop at this point to ask any questions, noting that uh, um, we'll get into some of these data, and so I may defer some of those until later to the presentation. I see one hand up. Yep, Go Corey ahead. Niles. Sorry. Corey, thank you. Thank you, John. Hey, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Brian. I forgot to introduce myself last time. Corey Niles, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, well, Brian, I think um, if you're saying there's a, a trade-off between doing a a Bayesian decision table and a spatial assessment, then <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know what to think. I've, I've been a big fan of uh, how they do it in the whiting um, fishery and how that where they have where, where the Bayesian method makes that possible. But at the same time, um, I'm not fully understanding what you're suggesting here in terms of backing off um, the spatial aspects. It sounds like you're um, Kind of backing off, but but also having some spatial components. So I guess my to try to get to my question. Um, I guess you know I remember a couple of national SSC meetings ago where one of uh, our West Coast assessors said there was no interest from managers in, in spatial assessments, and I was like, no, we're, that's the opposite. We want to know. We want to know information about uh, regions and and, and and we want spatial assessments. Um, you know, even if there is a larger degree of mixing with canary. I think Jim and Chantel last time were like, you're assuming complete panmixia of, of, of the tails from the north of Washington to, to California is, is probably not realistic either. So, um, 
it was a step forward. We never really quite explored all we could in terms of using information about the, the which I think the areas were basically states or maybe not that, but so it was a step forward that we never we never kind of fully explored. So it was um, little little again not fully understand what you're suggesting here. Kind of um, disappointed that you might be backing off the spatial aspect. But yeah, could you just elaborate on on what we might get? Uh, by paring it down, like, will we still get information if there were like a local depletion issue? Would we still be with this assessments to be able to identify that? I'll stop to see if I think you can see if you get what I'm asking here. Um, of, of course, Karen, Corey, and and thank you for the question. That that is important. First off, we're not doing a Bayesian model. Uh, that was a research paper. Um, we are using our standard stock synthesis approach. Uh, likelihood, maximum likelihood estimation. Um, in terms of answering kind of your main point, the the previous model explored adding spatial components to the population, and that was strictly through apportioning recruitment from a, a coastwide population level stock recruitment relationship. That is used to kind of gather patterns in exploitation history uh, across the coast. We are saying that, that we're going to explore whether that added complexity really changes model results. Um, doing that triples the number of fleets, triples the amount of selectivities, uh, makes it more complex. The other component is that normally spatial modeling is included with say tagging data or movement. Um, here, we don't have any of that, uh, and so there's limited data to inform those apportionments. It adds a lot of flexibility in the model, and so we're looking at really, is that extra flexibility and complexity warranted? That's what we're trying to get at. Um, I agree with you. I think there's more movement towards incorporating spatial dynamics. So far, based on the last assessment, doing all that complexity, both in terms of modeling time and uh, model runtime, didn't show to have large changes of, of assuming a coastwide model. Um, the assessment report itself didn't break down um, area based trends. Uh, it still is a, a single estimate, um, single catch values, single population trends that are reported. So that's our justification. Uh, at the moment, we're planning to explore that. Um, depending on what we find, we may go um, not incorporating that population structure through apportioning recruitment, or we may, it may have an effect and um, we're just not sure what that'll look like with the new data. Does that answer your question, Corey? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, and I saw Cuba chatted there. Um, yeah, not not too disappointed uh, about the Bayesian aspect, but, but uh, someday maybe you guys can do that. But now I get out, uh, yeah, I'm food for thought here. I'll, I might have more later, but yeah, we do. My impression was we could tell a little bit different, you know, being from Washington in this, my selective memory was we were able to tell to some degree that um, the population was never as depleted off the north as it was in the south. Um, and that's the type of information. Um, hopefully the status of the stock, it makes it somewhat moot, but um, it, it's still, in, you know, if there's no cost to figuring out abundance at a more local level that we're always going to want that but i'm hearing you guys say there's a cost and so i no, appreciate your evaluating this and thank you for helping me understand better what you're looking at yep so i see in the chat that showing the slideshow is actually smaller ah. <laughs> i have been signed out Apologies for this. I guess that this doesn't look any too much different than than this, maybe slightly smaller, but less busy. 
I'm going to continue on like this, if that's okay. Um, John. Thank you, Brian. Um, with respect to the fleet structure and looking at the past star panel report and assessment, I did notice a, a recommendation to think about um, different ways to structure the trawl fleet. And I think the thing that was identified uh, more than anything was um, bycatch of canary rockfish in the pink shrimp bottom trawl fishery, yep. which has probably maybe not been eliminated, but been greatly reduced by some of the bycatch reduction measures that have um, gone on in that fishery over the years. Have you thought at all about that? As I, I, that certainly seemed like a reasonable one to me, that that fishery tends to catch much smaller, younger fish on soft bottom. Um, and it seems to be, and the catches aren't very much, but the length data would have kind of an odd influence. Have you thought about how you might be dealing with that at all? Yes, we have. I am going to defer my full answer until after our next section. Uh, maybe the next two sections, landings and lengths, if, uh, and I'll ask you to raise it again at that point. Does that sound Sounds good? good? Yeah, thanks. So I am going to carry on. John gave us a great segue into now moving into the section on landings. Here is a fishery dependent table, just briefly outlining the data that we have and know of to use for addressing both landings, really removals, so catches and discards, uh, and also adding some lengths and age information here. This is divided by commercial and recreational sources, uh, PACFIN being a big one for commercial landings, but also looking at historical state reconstructions to take that time series back into the past. For discards with the commercial side, looking at WICOP, which is West Coast Groundfish Observer Program, as well as talking about some assumed historical rates. Uh, and then the length and age data is available in PACFIN and, and that'll incorporate some of the um, biological information that we're going to be looking at. On the rec side, it's a mix of various data sources. I won't reference all of these, those can be seen and read on your own. I will note that the data that we're showing 2022 is not always up to date um, and we will update those as those become complete and finalized. Our overview for this section is described here. We are planning to uh, separate by trawl and non-trawl gears. That will be clarified specifically what that means. I believe in the next slide, uh, our recreational fleet, we plan to combine across private charter, which is a PC node is often how it's um, labeled and then private rental modes, uh, which is PR. You'll see that in this presentation. The majority of removals are from the commercial trawl gear. Uh, there is an obvious effect of the period of no retention when this stock was declared over fish lasting from roughly 2000 to 2016. That will show up in the data. Um, I will note that our historical commercial time series and the California recreational uh, removals have they're not, we haven't yet looked at those. Uh, we plan to get those and those will be included in the assessment. Shown here, um, so moving on into commercial landings. These are, um, our source here is PACFIN. The, the non-trawl gear is hook and line, net gear, and other, which is a mix of, of very small components. Um, the trawl component uh, is a mix of bottom trawl, midwater trawl, and shrimp trawl. Um, shrimp trawl was assumed to be a non-trawl component in the last assessment um, based on conversations among our stat, thinking that those gears more uh, are more similar uh, in terms of selectivity to the trawl gear. We plan on combining those with the rest of the trawl gear. Regardless, the majority here is bottom trawl gear in these figures. I'll point out that the period of no retention is very evident in this figure uh, of very little landings 
uh, occurring during this time period. As we mentioned, we don't yet have historical estimates. Uh, these will be included in the model. Those include the following years and state combinations. Um, a question that we have, um, having not yet seen these, are they going to be very different um, from the last assessments? Um, our thought is we could pull from the last assessments. These are historical estimates and they may not very much one complication is moving shrimp trawl, um, unsure how large of a component that is in the last assessment. And so welcome knowledge, thoughts on how big of component shrimp trawl was. So I see a number of comments. I, I don't know who was first. <laughs> John, I see John. John Field, I see you. Go ahead. I should be quick. I don't think the California historical landings estimates have changed one bit, so you should be fine using those. Um, Whitney? Whitney? Thanks. Uh, this is actually not a question not related to the shrimp trawl, um, but so sorry that I can't give you an answer there. Um, but I remember in one of the earlier slides um, at the Hake was listed as a fleet, um, and I was just wondering, is that uh, separate from this trawl fleet that you're showing here, or is that part of what is listed as midwater trawl, um, just to be clear? Great question, Whitney. That is a separate fleet. We have not looked at um, that data yet. That comes from the At Sea Observer Program, and uh, that's something we, we just haven't gotten to in time for this presentation. John, do you still have a question? No, I think my hand is uh, still up. Allie? Okay. Allie, do those make much of a contribution in the past? That's fine. Alrighty, I'm going to move on here. Thank you for that. The commercial discards, as we mentioned, uh, as was done in the previous assessment, I plan, we, we plan um, to model removals as a combination of landings and mortality from discards, so dead releases. Uh, there is recent data from 2002 to 2022 from WICOP, uh, that data is broken down by gear and area. We have that data. We just haven't been able to look at it yet due to time. Thus, that can provide estimates of discards that we can include in the model. Historical rates have been assumed. Uh, the past assessment showed a combination of rates here, um, noting that the estimates from 1981 to 1994, 5% were based on a picture study. Um, estimates prior to that time and later to that time, at the moment, I'm not sure how they were done. These were updated at the STAR review. Uh, and then estimates between 2000 and 2001, which would be during the period um, that 
the stock was just declared overfished are based on an average of the first three years of WICOP studies. Um, what we are unsure of and would like discussion on is whether there is any data to inform these other than the Pickett study, and if these estimates seem to still be valid for uh, catches kind of prior to WICOP data. Does anyone have have comments or information to inform that? I guess we should just use what they used last time. Seems a reasonable first blush. So I'm I'm not hearing anything. Uh, so unless there's changes, we will plan to use the same rates as was done here. Does moving around the shrimp trawl fishery adjust these at all? I don't think so. I believe these were applied across fleets. In any information by gear for 2000, 2001, we can use the same process. Those values might update with that information. So moving on now into recreational removals. Um, these come from a mix of sources. Uh, we have Recfin data and MERS era data for California. I have yet to look at the MERS era data. And so this is pulled from a presentation that John Budrick provided. Um, thank you, John. Um, these are now removals, which include discard and landing estimates. Um, this slide has Recfin data, 2005 to 2022 and MERS era data 1980 to 2003. There are some gaps that we're aware of in this data that we will work on with California filling in to get a finalized time series. Uh, our plan here, these are showing a split between modes. Our plan is to combine these modes. If we look at disposition data, um, which we have in RecFin. So this is only for RecFin years. Uh, and this is a common pattern among the recreational fleets, or recreational areas uh, in the States. Discard is much higher during the period of no retention. Uh, and then it, um, retain, the number of retained fish increase quite a bit more afterwards. Noting, I haven't yet done this for MERS. Um, looking at this as well for Oregon, here, this is a combination of reconstruction and RECFIN data. There is a period, uh, a same pattern here showing the higher proportion of released dead during the period of no retention. However, outside of that, retained fish dominate. One question here for Oregon removals is our data end in 1979. Presumably there were some removals prior to that down to some point. The previous assessment assumed this was zero in 1978. Does using that same assumption make sense for this cycle? Allie, I see your hand up.
Thank you, Allie. Any other comments on that? Seeing none, I will move on. We do note that there are some differences in mostly historical period for the Oregon removals than from the last assessment. Uh, and so the, the time series will be a bit different, um, although in the grand scheme of things, this is likely to affect the model very little, given the large component of commercial trawl catch during this period. Moving on to Washington, uh, these data are provided by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. They are provided in numbers for this cycle. We plan to fill in kind of the known gaps uh, using a number of approaches and we'll work with, with Washington on how best to do that. Uh, comparison with the previous assessment as those were in metric tons is somewhat difficult. Uh, the other, I guess, difference here is that we are provided the total number of releases, which again have a larger proportional component during the period of no retention. Um, we need to make choices on what mortality component of that, as well as whether there is any other pre-2001 discards. Um, so are, can we expect that prior to 2001, there were very limited releases in the wreck fishery for Washington? I do not see any any hands. Uh, I trust that there's not anything in the chat or Kiva would tell me. There is um, not. So we'll likely assume that that is not the case. Um, discards kind of stop in 2001 are, are negligible enough so as not to include. Dave Sampson asks, when did catch quotas kick in for wreck fisheries? <laughs> Um, th this is Teresa. Um, so for Washington um, recreational, um, we, not like Oregon, uh, Washington has um, have a, a daily back limit for bottom fish for a long, long time. Um, so back in the years, uh, we have like 10 bottom fish per day, and then we gradually reduce to like six, and now I think it's probably seven. So assuming no discard for Washington um, at all may not work. Do you have a proposal, an alternative proposal, Teresa? Well, I will leave that to our GMT rep. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, if there is a reconstructed, um, The rules making, I think there were probably um, back limit analysis they did in the past that may shed some light, but I can definitely work with them and come up with some proposal or we can okay. have discuss based on the, the rule change history to decide what makes sense. Okay, thanks Teresa. Uh, we don't have any information to inform it um, at on our end. Uh, Jim Hasty. Yeah, hi. Um, the pickage uh, studies from the late eighties that I referenced in the chat earlier. Um, the back in in the 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 dark ages of the GMT when I was on it in the nineties. Uh, there was commonly an assumption of 16% discard that was used for most of the rockfish based on research from the, the pickage data. And I think that might have been uh, formulated primarily for based on widow or yeah, on widow data. 
but there may be some useful information in there about uh, likely discards of canary as well in the trawl fleet. So one of those was a mesh size study and the other was a discard study. And John Wallace took part in those, so he is a good source of information from that. Jim, is that for commercial discards or recreational discards? Commercial. Okay, so that won't help with this problem that we're discussing right now, right? No, but it will help, I suppose, with the uh, with the commercial side. Of it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Corey. Yeah, hey, Kiva. Sir, um, just echo, well, Teresa. That we can all huddle up. We weren't prepared to talk about it today, but Teresa, I, I, maybe I'm confusing things. But I know last cycle we did look at maybe discards and like for folks who were the recreational fishing for salmon. Um, so we've done stuff in the past. Don't have it ready for you today, but let it, we can circle back and um, let you know more definitively if we have ideas. But I think if we've I, tried. Is I don't you, know. Somebody, somebody else might might know better than I. But uh, one possible source of information would be on on rec discard would be uh, the old Murphs data, which I believe is still accessible at RecVin, though not through the normal portal. Um, theoretically, they were recording both retained and discarded fish as part of that, but I don't know how accurate those numbers are, but there may be something there. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, um, it sounds like we can work up with uh sounds like assuming zero it's probably inaccurate and in that we can work with with our state partners to come up with something that is more reasonable thank you all brian you have a couple more hands raised i see corey niles and well jim hasey i'm assuming that's a carryover lingering yeah uh, carryover sorry thank Copy. you john Okay, you're good to move. So, as I mentioned, we we currently have number of releases. Um, we currently have number of releases by depth. The we do not have the release mortalities by depth. Um, I understand that those uh, presumably have been available, um, and so the general question we have. Um, Sorry, let me step back here. The, the figure you're showing is the proportions of releases by depth, noting that there are some that are unknown. Those we can work with uh, and account for what is known to come up with general releases by depth. We would like to, to turn this into um, uh, release mortality and, and look to, th there's a number of ways that we can do this. Um, some are going to be better and more accurate than others. We could pull from Recton. Um, we could look at discard estimates from the previous assessment. Uh, those likely will be in metric tons as opposed to numbers, but we can get rates, presumably. Um, what we'd like to do is, is estimate these using um, release by depth values, taking uh, mortality rates by depth. Um, our, our general question is, are these available? Corey. Yeah, I don't know if our experts are on here today about this. I know, and I don't know if anyone else from recent GMT day, but they have been, and I'm, I may be confused here, but I know we, Canary was one of the, one of the, uh, the original species we worked on collectively. So again, might be something we got to follow up with you again on. Um, That's fine. But we do, yeah. It, and, um, yeah, I'm not seeing there's this is a long list of participants here, but yeah, we'll sorry about that. We'll have to we can get back to you. But that's no worry. We we don't mean to put people on the spot, but 
we would like to incorporate discards and having those mortality races mortality rates allows us to do that um kind of in a, in the common way that that is done the fourth yeah. option of course is to borrow from the Oregon rec fleet um and just take the mortality rates there those may or may not be available by depth though and I'm not going to put Lynn Mattis on the spot here, but I know she would, um, unless she wants to be, would know more recent memory with really, but I, we, we have to have those for Washington too. Um, John Budrick, I saw your hand and then maybe Teresa. Yeah, uh, discard mortality in the recreational fisheries has kind of gone in two directions for Canary, one being uh, discarded at the surface versus discarded uh, with a descending device. Um, so we began accounting for uh, release at the surface with a specific rate by depth, depth by depth, we called it, um, since I believe it was 2009, we started doing that. Um, then the uh, rates accounting for the use of descending devices came on in I believe 2013. Um, so depending on the time period that you're talking about, things get a little complicated when you have a first bifurcation of the disposition of how it was released, and then you have the additional complication of the mortality rate by depth. Um, so I, I think you, you know you, you could use some. I don't know if there are some stanzas or periods or proportions that can be broken out for a generalization. Um, but I think in the historical period, I mean, I don't think people were really using descending devices, so you don't have to worry about that so much. And in the current period, you have probably have direct estimates um, available. So you could probably use the, you know, some assumption about the uh, historical proportion of catch by depth and the discard mortality rates for surface release to derive a generalized mortality rate um, that could just be applied over time historically. Um, essentially, you're you're multiplying through within each depth bin the rate and the proportion of catch by depth, um, and then summing the product to get yourself a, a general mortality rate that's applicable across time. And perhaps that that might be one way to get a generalized rate in the historical period. And by historical period, you're saying probably before at least 2020, 2005. Yeah, before two thousand, um, before two thousand four, I think that that would be reasonable. But I mean, you could do two thousand. I mean, eh. I mean that they if there might be discard rates that just had different rates that were accepted during the time period between, um, say, two thousand four and two thousand and nine, when we started doing the depth dependent mortality rates accounting for surface release. Um, as to what period is most appropriate, given that there was their management, you know, implications are depth restrictions that affected the proportion of catch by depth. You might just have one period for when it was, um, we're subject to depth restrictions in one period when it was unrestricted that you're using to derive your um, proportions of catch by depth. Just to make it relatively simplistic to just have two periods um, because those proportions of catch by depth are likely to differ given the depth restrictions in place. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I think either way we'll probably work with um, for any estimates of releases prior to 2001, we'll work with um, Washington on on resolving ways to, to look at discards as well. Teresa. Um, so for Washington, um, we don't have any um, discard um, using descending device by depths available, the, the estimates are not available at this point. So for the purpose of this assessment, you should use the SSC adopted surface release mortality for this depth spin and this, these depth spin follow that original um, SSC approved surface release mortality rate. I think that document link was provided to you and Kiva in one of our uh, Google. Yeah, um, yeah, we did see that, Teresa. It was a really long document. It was it looks like it covered a lot of different topics. So if you could just point us to where we might find it in that document, there should um, be a table. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so I recommend that you use the only remaining question is really how to deal with our historical um, release rate, right? Yep. Um, and and then what is the average mortality to apply to those historical release? That's the remaining topic. Okay. We'll uh, follow up with you, Teresa, on uh, on perhaps what table that is. But it sounds like we have a path forward, at least for these questions. So thank you for that. Corey, do you have anything to add to Teresa? No, but I just can't figure out how to this, this hand thing. Okay, <laughs> no worries. All righty, so I'm going to move on. Thank you all. Um, this kind of summarizes what we've already talked about here, um, planning to, to model these as landings and mortality. So this is the end of our landing section. This re-asks the questions that we had. I feel like we have answers to all of these. Uh, Kiva, would you agree? I think we can then move on. Um, that ends our landing component topic. John, I haven't forgotten about your question, um, and I, I want to address it after the lengths and ages, because I think um, looking at that information, um, when we get into uh, specifically answering that question, we'll, we'll probably look at both at the same time. So moving on, our next section is looking at the available biological data. Um, these are simplified length and age compositions, just looking at sample size and the general age and lengths of them. Uh, there's no further adjustments to those, um, such as weighting by catches, et cetera. Um, so these are, um, so far what we've looked at is uh, supporting kind of our general approach of combining trawl and non-trawl groupings for commercial and combining the two modes across recreational. The majority of, um, of samples here, and we're going to look both at commercial and recreational, come from commercial bottom trawl gear. Um, that's some of the premise of John Field's question. Um, looking at the, the predominance of commercial bottom trawl samples, a lot of those come from Oregon. Uh, we have some new reading. Um, those data are not yet available, but they may result in some additional age comps, specifically for the non trawl commercial and recreational fleets. Uh, and then also we'll talk a little bit about um, looking at the various read types, so surface or break and burn, uh, and our plan is to use only break and burn reads for our age compositions. Uh, to start off with, looking at commercial and age sampling, our source is PACFIN. Um, there's some uh, additional steps we take in looking at the PACFIN BDS data, so the biological data. Um, what I'm going to show is market sampling that is sampled randomly. So that involves removing commercial onboard sampling. Um, the reason for doing this is that it uh, has the potential of being double counted with the WICOP data. Um, so if we're looking at uh, commercial lengths, we exclude that. Um, also, there's a, a number of data that have a sampling method of purposeful, purposive um, from Washington. Uh, those are relatively few. We plan to exclude that as well as a number of samples outside U.S. waters, primarily Canada. Um, we also are removing uh, recent special project samples in Oregon. Uh, the reason for this is that these can come about for any number of reasons and may not be indicative of the uh, fleet itself, so we aren't using those. Um, we do have a number of special project samples from the early period that we do plan to incorporate. Um, talking with Oregon, these were designated special projects based on um, lacking full documentation uh, kind of our look into those suggests they are very similar to market sampling. Um, they were sampled randomly, so we plan to incorporate those. So the figures you'll see in the following slides um, are based on PACFIN data with these um, treatments of the data. 
So this will be a, a series of slides showing length and ages. Um, here we are looking at the number of samples, uh, California in the top row, Oregon in the middle row and Washington in the bottom row. As you can see, the majority come from bottom trawl gears. Um, those are in the blue. There are a fair number of lengths uh, just before 2000 from California. Uh, the previous assessment did not include any non-trawl age comps. Um, so those would be the very little and few samples in red here on the rightmost panel. As I had mentioned earlier, there is current work to age some of these age samples for Oregon and Washington. And so we will explore whether adding those age comps uh, is reasonable based on just the sample size therein. Looking at the distributions, um, this is the overall, over all years. There are differences between these two gears for California in length and some in age. Um, in Oregon, there's very strong differences, yet very little differences in ages. Uh, in Washington, there's little difference in length uh, and it seems to be stronger differences in ages between non-trawl and trawl gears. I will note that there are very few samples of non-trawl gears, uh, so perhaps this difference is a bit deceptive just based on sample size. Um, with this and with our thought of potentially simplifying our choices, um, the overall catch of non-trawl in Washington is very low. Uh, the lengths tend to be similar. Uh, our question is, would it make sense to then combine the Washington non-trawl and trawl gears? Are there components that suggest those should be kept separate? And Teresa, I see your hand raised. So it might not have ever been put down from her last discussion. Yeah, that's a receiver. I don't know how to lower my hand. Okay. Oh, oh maybe click on the raise hand again, maybe. Is it gone? Okay. It is. Uh, Corey, I see your hand raised. <laughs> yeah, this time was on purpose. Yeah, it was, I don't know. It's probably the same as before, but it's not as clear to me as when you're lowering it versus raising it. Uh, but on your issue here, um, and it, it, Jim Hasty is going back to his dark ages, the GMT. Would, but I, in terms of where they fish, I, I think there would be a, off of Washington, there would be, you know, and I'm not sure exactly what history, historical period talking about, but I think, you know, most of the, our non trawl fishing happens, um, you know, since the, the RC area, seaward of 100 fathoms. When I think our highest catch as a canary would have been shoreward of 100 fathoms um, with hot spots up in northern Washington. So I think, in my mind at least, this, the fleets would have been separated. But, um, and, and yeah, there's very little, I think, catch of currently of canary in, in the non trawl gears that fish off Washington. We don't have a near shore fishery for fixed gear, or it's just the trawling that happens shoreward to the RCA. So what I'm hearing is keeping it separate would be a reasonable kind of first choice. Corey, well, why think... do you think they're catching the same ages and lengths then? Excuse me, I just had to take a bite of bread. Why? Oh, right. the, uh, I don't know. Maybe because the other maybe, states, because yeah. in in Oregon and California, they're catching different sizes of fish. I, I think if you look at the magnitude, the trawl's got to be it's massive. Big, yeah. Yeah, and the non trawl's got to be tiny. But yeah, correct. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe in that northern area, it's it's the same. That fish being caught by both, despite the depth. But, Uh, John Budrick. Yeah, just to say, uh, some of the difference between states might be pertinent here relative to the. Near shore, uh, not really having a 
I believe, to my understanding, Washington had closed its near shore waters to the commercial uh, fishery. Um, there might be more specifics or details there, but for California, we have two things going on. We've got some catch going on seaward on the seaward side of the RCA when they're fishing for um, mainly sable fish. Um, and then you've got the near shore fishery operating and some bycatch occurring or catch occurring there as well. Uh, but the size composition tends to be smaller fish from what we can see in the, the area that's a shoreward um, side of the ice RCA. Um, but in it seems in Washington, you may not have that commercial component that's shoreward uh, because of the closure. Uh, that, that was just kind of the thinking, which basically puts your hooks on the same grounds or some more similar grounds to where you're trawling in Washington versus California and Oregon, where they have a, a strong near shore fishery where they're also catching canaries um, and they tend to be smaller fish, um, making it so that you have a, a difference in the trawl and the non trawl. But I don't know if there are other intricacies relative to, you know, the regulation history or the nature of the fishery up there that would cause you to still want to keep them separate. Um, cool. Thanks, Washington. John. Yeah. Uh, Jim? I would and then just being mindful John. of time. Oh, oh yeah, I, I would more. agree with John. Ditto, John. I think that that explains probably most or the vast majority of the difference or the reason why Washington, uh, the length and age distribute or length distributions are so similar where they aren't elsewhere. Thanks. Uh, there was one other hand, but you put it down. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, it, I, I, it seems like people sort of don't love the idea of combining these gear types, but if, if they are catching fish in the same area, it does make sense that they would be catching similar ages and lengths because there's just very little composition data to inform selectivity of, of Washington um, non trawl gear. Will, Jasper? You had your hand up earlier. Yeah, thanks, Kiva. I wasn't sure exactly how useful this might be, but I guess it's a question in part for Corey. You know, so I guess a side point here, I'm the uh, the ground fish biologist for the Macaw tribe out of uh, Nia Bay. And so I'm just thinking about how samples of canary from the Macaw trawl fishery might be lumped into here. You know, Macaw does technically fish within the RCA lines just because of some differences with travel regulation and how that all works. And so, you know, th there may be a portion of samples from Washington that are technically inside the RCA from the trawl fishery. We don't really encounter a canary in the long line fishery, so any non-trawl gear. Um, I don't know if that would complicate things, and I'm not totally sure what number of samples you're getting from the travel fishery, but just something to keep in mind as we're going through this, I guess. Yeah, thank you. That's good for us to keep in mind. Yeah, good point, Will. Um, and it will, and also, um, you're seeing the canary more in a, a midwater style trawl versus the the bottom trawl. And yeah, we have exactly. And yeah, we haven't had, I don't know what years these are from, but we have not had a lot of bottom state licensed non-treaty bottom trawl up there in recent years. But yeah, so that good point with Teresa will remember better than I will kind of, we do sample. I can't remember if we sample just your hook and line fleet or those midwater landings too, but we can look that up or if Teresa knows off the top of her head. Yeah, just mindful I, of I time don't... we might, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Teresa. No, I'm just telling Corey that I don't remember that on top of my head. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. I just want to be mindful of time. Uh, we have quite a bit more material to cover. Um, so we might try Thank to you, Kiva. move along. Um, so uh, I will note I'm seeing in the chat that indeed I did mislabel the X axis here. This is not length, this is age. My apologies for that. So, um, kind of our, our last point here with the um, 
commercial material is a previous assessment used two page comp types. Um, these were surface age reads and break and burn age reads. Uh, they use their own unique error matrices and biases. Um, they tested a sensitivity excluding the surface age reads. Surface age reads tend to be much more biased, um, much more difficult to age fish, especially those that are long lived like canary. Um, looking at this information and based on the sensitivity, uh, the results of that sensitivity showed that excluding surface age reads really had little effect on model results. Um, we plan to exclude those surface age reads. So the surface age reads are the one in red. Uh, we do acknowledge that this will exclude uh, about five early years. Um, so um, kind of years before 1980. If we look at the data in terms of those ages, those samples seem to be unusually low, especially compared to surface age reads in years where break and burn age reads also existed. Um, our thought is this is simplifying the structure. Those um, comps provide very little and they're likely biased. Um, our plans are to exclude these. Uh, I will note that, that this choice was also uh, explored in the 2005 and 2007 benchmarks and ultimately surface ages were excluded there. Um, so we're kind of going back to the past um, with that choice. Um, but that is our plan. If there's any heart, heartburn over that, please let us know. Um, but this is likely to have limited effect, just knowing that that would be a change. Yeah, Brian, just a question on this. I'm just curious. And you may not know, but maybe the state reps do. Are these age structures still available, locatable, possible to revisit in age? Not likely in time for this assessment, but potentially in the future. And I recognize it's probably a question for others more so than yourself. Yeah, I'm I'm not aware. Well, perhaps no one is. I'll mention it in the notes and we can move on. Okay. So that is it for commercial. Um, before getting into the recreational lengths and ages, um, John, I do wanna go visit your question. So um, I need to get out of this and into extra slides where we have the breakdown. I'm going to show outside of presenter view. This is the breakdown of the commercial landings by year. Um, trawl here uh, is in blue. Shrimp trawl is in pink, which really only shows up in Oregon. Um, and then there's some midwater trawl that's showing in recently. To our knowledge, the midwater trawl is a, a field that has been recently. Um, and by recent, I mean, um, I, I'm not entirely sure how recent, but it has been a field that's been added and breaking down the historical trawl versus midwater trawl is not possible. Um, but the main take home is that shrimp trawl is a very small component. Um, and then other than recent years, midwater trawl is starting to show up due to the new field. Uh, and so looking at these, hesitant to to divide out midwater trawl with trawl gear, and then the component of shrimp trawl seems quite small. Um, it seems like breaking out bottom trawl, having a bottom trawl trawl gear and a non-bottom trawl trawl gear adds a fair bit of additional complexities in the model that, that seem to be less um, critical. If we then look at commercial comps for these, note here, lengths are now on the right, 
Um, I switched them up in our main presentation. Again, the ages, the, the label here is, is in there correct. That should be ages. Um, for Oregon, where shrimp trawl is more common, um, it's still very rare. Um, shrimp trawl here is this distribution that overlaps the midwater trawl pretty well and has a similar distributional range as the overall trawl gear. Uh, and so it, it doesn't seem to be a very large difference in size between those three gears. Um, and so all of those combined with um, the low catches of those non-bottom trawl trawl gears suggests to us that, that keeping them together as one fleet seems to make sense. Um, and that's at least how we're looking at and leaning toward, to it now. Discards we have yet to look at, that may change. Uh, our planned approach, um, and uh, I'm working with with Chantel, who who um, looks at the WICOP data to to look into that in more detail. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Yeah, it would be interesting to uh, see if if the discards do change your thinking on that. But based on what I'm seeing here, that seems like a reasonable approach. So we are now here. Excellent. And Brian, I just want to do a time check. So it's 2.20 right now. Yes, I will speed up. Um, moving on to the recreational length and age samples. Um, here we're looking at rep fin data. I'm showing retained fish only. Um, there's a few released fish samples. We typically look at retained to capture what is being caught in the fishery uh, and kept um, as opposed to releases, which may or may not be dead. Uh, Oregon data includes a combination of rep fin and MRF areas years. Uh, again, noting California MRF data are available, but we have yet to analyze those and we'll add that data to what we have here. Um, I also will note that I have not yet looked at the provided Washington sport bio data. We have that data. Um, in place of this for this presentation, I'm going to show RecFin, which can provide some general, um, allow us to explore initial patterns in the data. But ultimately, the data we'll use for Washington will be from the sport bio data. Um, we are combining PC and PR nodes. We'll say majority of lakes are unsampled. Uh, and then we'll note that the previous assessment did not include rec comps, um, in part because there are very few, uh, only from Washington and Oregon. Uh, we plan to revisit that. Um, there are plans to age Washington structures uh, from recent years as well as Oregon structures. Uh, again, that choice will be based ultimately on what is aged. Previously, we the previous assessment used a single sex composition. Much of the samples were uh, unsexed. Looking at that breakdown, um, particularly for Oregon and Washington, there are a number of female and male samples. So samples that are sexed, these almost all come after 2005, so after the last date. The date of the last assessment. So we're we will explore looking at sex specific comps. Um, probably be for Oregon, given the few numbers, we may um, combine into a single unsexed comp. Um, but we will look at that. There's not a lot of differences in the sexes for Oregon. Some noticeable differences for Washington. Again, females tend to be larger, uh, so this pattern is not surprising. Uh, the questions we do have for this is looking at um, whether released fish should be incorporated into the comps, um, and specifically if we're missing important information by excluding those released fish. Uh, if we look at kind of the disposition of lengths across years, this pattern only is uh, observed in California and Oregon. There are no released fish in Washington. Um, released fish tend to be smaller. Um, if we also look at when they occur, 
released fish are occurring in higher proportions in the periods of no retention. Um, so for California, that tends to be 2009 to 2016. Uh, for Oregon, it's 2004 and 2014. So um, if released fish are smaller and they make up a greater proportion of our samples in certain years, um, is that an issue? Uh, looking just at the proportions of those years where released fish are more common, however, shows that the differences in lengths are not that large um, relative to all years. And so our thought is including release fish is likely going to have a very limited effect uh, by the same vein, excluding them is likely not going to have a large effect on model results. And our plan, at least at the moment, is to keep them excluded. Uh, welcome any thoughts on that if we are missing something um, where that should or would uh, kind of change our thought process uh, john field and corey niles <laughs> John, I think I think John's hand is residual. Yes, it must um, be. Apologies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, it looks like is, is your hand is still up. Well, it's the first time for my hand to be up. Um, it, I think you, if you're going to be using the release data, you would need to do some sort of time blocking, so that the years when the um, retention was prohibited be treated differently than when than the years when retention was allowed because you're going to get very different size different size um, size ranges in those years where they were prohibited from retaining anything then we had a couple of years where they could retain one or two and they probably kept the bigger ones and now they can retain all of them so th there is going to be some time differences in those sizes just something to keep in mind if you decide to use the release data yeah, with that, Lynn, sorry, I jumped ahead here. Um, would those time blocks be different than what I'm showing here in this middle panel? Because uh, at least with the, what I see are... in terms of lengths, there's not as big of a difference during those periods where um, release fish are more common than retained. At least for the Oregon, which I think is the lower series there. Yeah. Those seem like the good years, the the appropriate years where there was no retention allowed. We started with some limited retention, but it looks like that doesn't have an impact on things too much. At least, yeah. So at least for Oregon, that seems like the good years to separate out. Yeah, because our our initial plan is to not include released fish. Okay, it was just a caveat yep. that if you do keep that in mind okay. the, with the prohibited retention. Thank you for can, taking my thoughts. No, of course. Thanks for providing them. So I will move on. I see no other hands raised residual or not. Um, and Lynn's question then leads us very well into talking about selectivity blocking. Um, specifically, uh, any years where major changes occurred in the fishery. I think the period of no retention is, is probably a period where obviously things changed. Um, the previous assessment had a block for commercial flights at that time, um, and then an additional block for trawl fleets. Um, there was no selectivity block in the recreational fleet, uh, and so we welcome any other years that would make sense to block. Um, I will also note that the previous assessment mirrored selectivity across each fleet among the states. So Washington, Oregon, California had the same selectivity um, for each fleet type. Um, we plan to revisit that assumption, um, but in addition to that, are there any other years that are not shown here being 2000, kind of between 10 and 2011, where we should apply selectivity blocks?
John. Yeah, and I guess we, we've discussed this internally as a group to some degree, but I think it's a there's a time period where the depth restrictions were highly limited, limiting in terms of availability of fish in deeper depths. Um, that began in California, depending on the management area that you're talking about, uh, between around 2001 and 2003, um, depending on where you're talking about within the distribution of canary rockfish, um, to 2016 when, uh, you know, after 2016, we started resuming some access to deeper depths that used to be commonly fished um, in the past. Uh, but that's the only other time period that I can see overlaps with the availability of that uh, discard data as well. But um, in any event, uh, the 2009 on the discard data that you showed in the previous slide seems a little bit late compared to when we started collecting that discard data. There should be a fair bit of it since 2003. Um, but yeah, for one reason or another, there may not been have been much represented. I have a, another distribution of that that we did for a presentation we provided to NIMS folks, and it showed what looked like to be more fish earlier um, that were discarded fish that were measured. So I'm not quite sure why the 2009 popped out there, but okay. in any event. We can look at that. Yeah, yeah, it's just the data yeah, became so... available in 2003. So we do have it from onboard sampling earlier. In return, in terms of blocking 2016, would that be both for commercial and rec or just one of them? I'd have to take a closer look at the commercial side. Mel okay. is on the, on the call, but we can always get back to you on yep. that. Um, just because, you know, when they did the last assessment, things were uh, still highly constrained in terms of access to certain depths. Um, and then, uh, you know, that, so that access resumed both in the commercial and the recreational fishery, but perhaps at slightly different times. So there may be uh, a need to do a block in the middle and then uh, some resumption of access deserving its own block or a resumption of the pre uh, dub restriction block. Might may only be a sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these explorations may or may not end up in the base model, um, but thank you for that. So, these are all the questions we have addressed. A lot of these, I feel good about where we are with those. Um, I am going to then end my component and turn it over to Kiva. Um, Marlene. And Brian, I think I don't have, I'm not, uh, I don't think I have permission to share. So why don't you just keep sharing and we can. Uh, Marlene can give you permission uh, okay. and that way you can control it. So Marlene, can I stop sharing and you give it to Kiva? Yes, absolutely. Just a moment, Kiva. Ah. Okay, you should be on. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, there we go. Oops. And then the slideshow. Okay. Um, so I'm going to cover the last two topics, um, the indices and the biological information. Um, so first I'll go over indices. Um, so I would overview um, the sort of three main surveys that were included in the previous assessment um, was the um, West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey, which I'll refer to as the Trawl Survey. Um, and we'll have 19 years of data from that survey in this assessment. Um, then it included the Triennial Survey, um, which has nine years of data, but they're generally split into uh, five years of an early triennial and four years of a late triennial due to change in um, methodology. Um, and so because it's it covers a period of significant depletion, but because of that split, it is not necessarily able to inform that changes in the population at that point very well. And then the last assessment also included a recruitment index um, from the juvenile rockfish survey, which is also sometimes referred to as the rockfish recruitment and ecosystem assessment survey, um, only from the years of uh, coastwide coverage of, of that survey, which is since about 2001, but John's gonna correct me if that's wrong. Um, so I'll start, uh, Start with the triennial survey. Um, so these are just the number of samples that we have of lengths and ages from the triennial survey um, with the red line um, where we generally split the early and late triennial. 
Um, so a good good number of samples, especially from some years. Um, then there's uh, this is the number of samples that we have from the bottom trawl survey, um, which is really consistent coverage over a pretty it's the time series is getting more and more powerful at this point, um, which then sort of like weakens the value of the triennial once you have a survey that's um, this long. Um, and so we have, uh, you know, most years are getting at least 250 age samples um, and sometimes we're getting close to 1000. Um, and so the and the the 2022 data and the two th the ages from 2018 and 19 will be coming soon and there was no survey in 2020. Um, just sort of mapping out the catches from the trawl survey, um, we see that most of the catches come from north of sort of San Francisco Bay and the density generally increases as you go north. Um, there, so canary rockfish, as Brian mentioned at the beginning, um, is like a, is a schooling species, and so um, it's only caught in about 15% of tows less than 350 meters. So 350 meters is sort of what we're considering, um, sort of catchable rockfish depths. Um, and so it's only they only catch uh, canary in about 15% of tows within those depth that depth range. Um, but when they do catch canary, it's prone to these really extreme catch events that you can see with these huge red dots. Um, and so we'll look on the next slide, you can see, so this is, that map was across all years. Now you're seeing it split up. Um, so you can see the map of what was caught in each year. And so in 2006 and 2017 and 18, there were just these sort of monster canary rockfish toes, um, which makes it uh, tricky to model because you, how do you know if that monster toe was due to an actual increase in population abundance or just you've encountered a school of canary? Uh, so those are the, the big toes. Um, in any case, this is sort of our first stab at a coastwide index of um, canary rockfish from the trawl survey. Um, so you can see uh, it sort of increased um, between 2014 and 15 and has been bopping around and then actually decreased quite a bit from 2019 to 21. Um, so unclear if that 2019, um, yeah, so it yeah, decreased quite a bit from 2019 to 21. Um, we don't have the 2022 survey data yet. Um, so we're waiting to see on that. Um, and we're also still exploring sort of best ways to model these extreme catch events. Um, and I'll also add the previous assessment also included statewide included statewide indices rather than a coastwide index. But because of the way the models worked, they sort of um, mimic. They ended up being basically all the same, um, which is we I can show you the uh, state by state indices. Uh, they also look just like the coastwide index. Um, and then the juvenile rockfish survey, uh, again, we're sort of still exploring best, like the best methodology. So this uh, isn't necessarily a time series that's gonna go into the assessment, um, but this was sort of a first stab at a time series from this survey. Um, 2020 is definitely going to be excluded. They did not, they sampled a very small number of stations that year. Um, and I'm not actually sure why the 2006, um, is missing. Um, and you can see here is a map. Um, so unlike the trawl survey, um, the juvenile rockfish survey is a fixed station design. So these are, you can see points where um, the sort of frequently sam sampled stations are on the survey. Uh, John, you're going to like correct me <laughs> on the survey. Go for it. No, I'm not going to correct you. I am okay. not, also not sure. I, I'm pretty sure I sent you 2006 data. I know that five and six were yeah. really low years. So my guess is that we may not have had any positives at all in 2006. There were. So I looked. I actually looked okay. through the data. Um, there were some positives, but the index did not have a value. Wow. Well, um, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we can talk about that offline, I suppose. Yeah. But um, <laughs> Yeah, that surprised me as well. <laughs> um, so those are sort of the the sort of ones that we're considering most seriously. We are considering removing the triennial um, and sort of are open to people's thoughts on that. But just additional indices that um, we're sort of still exploring the utility of and may or may not include are um, sort of, and also keeping in mind that unlike the, um, the assessment this morning, this is a coastwide assessment. So the index really 
should be indicative in an ideal world would be indicative of coastwide abundance. Um, uh, so recreational fishery dependent indices and there are sampling programs from all three states that could be used to inform um, a rec index. Um, and then also all three states have fishery independent surveys that ca um, catch some canaries. So the Washington hook and line survey, the California ROV survey, and then um, a couple from Oregon. So these are ones that um, we're sort of still exploring the utility of um, and don't, uh, don't have data in hand yet. Uh, surveys that we're aware of and that we have sort of already decided not to include um, are the IPHC survey, which um, has existed for a long time and has never been included in a canary assessment, and our understanding is does not catch a lot of canary. Um, the Washington Olympic Coast YOI survey um, doesn't really see enough canary um, and uh, is a smaller spatial area. Um, and then a few from Oregon that were sort of uh, farther down on the list than the ones that were on the previous slide. So uh, questions about survey data, I guess, so our two questions are, are there any sources for indices um, or surveys that we have missed um, that were not on any of these lists? And then also we've been sort of considering removing the triennial survey, especially since it does get split up um, and the uh, trawl survey is uh, just becoming sort of carrying more and more weight. It tends to catch a broader range of sizes and ages of fish. Um, uh, so sort of what are people's thoughts on the triennial survey? I think my hand raised was residual, but since it's up, I'll <laughs> chime in a little anyway. Um, I guess I'll just this seems to come up a lot and we never really seem to resolve it, but I guess I would say that I still remain skeptical that it's absolutely necessary to split the trawl survey. So this my recollection is that this was based on seasonal differences in the timing. And there certainly are likely to be species for which seasonal differences in the timing might have an effect, like flatfish with strong seasonal migrations. But I have a more difficult time thinking that this would have a huge effect for canary. So, um, I think it was yeah. first split in a canary assessment. Yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean it was the the best <laughs> thing to do. Um, it just seems to me that this has been this thing that's kind of been carried over um, as if it were gospel. And I don't think it's necessarily gospel. Or I think okay. maybe it's time for a heretic to question the gospel and maybe rewrite it in a different language. I would just encourage you to, before throwing it out, maybe consider not splitting it, um, okay. doing a little uh, little more exploration on, on the merits or drawbacks of, of doing that, because it, it strikes me that uh, it, it always bothers me to see things that historically kind of drove our evolution of the understanding of yeah. stock dynamics for these species just tossed aside because we don't think they um, are contributing much anymore. I think there's information in there, whether it's split or not. So I'd en encourage you at least to um, maybe consider not splitting, consider leaving it in at the very least as a sensitivity. That's my two okay. cents, I suppose. I think the depth range also changed. Um, Kelly, she might tell me that. Yeah, can you hear me, Kiva? I can. Okay, great. So one thing that we did for Pacific Cake, and we were able to because we have so much data, is we took and did like a reverse retrospective. And as you take historical years of the assessment off, how does that change your perception of where the stock currently is? And that was really helpful mm -hmm. just to see, okay, we have this relatively short-lived species rel compared to all of these rockfish. But if you have data from the 1970s is when we start, if you take data away year by year by year, what does that change for what the current management looks like? And that was really helpful to just know if, like, if the model would change without the historical data in there. And so that could be one exercise that you guys could do just rather than taking just that survey in or out to seeing if there's a difference is just see how far back in time the model, the current status of the stock is actually being informed by historical data. And then with respect to the triennial, I think that there's 
some things that we can do to try to model the change in time. And yeah. uh, if people have general ideas on what actually changed in the triennial survey that would be relevant to this life history, that would be really informative for me to be able to be helpful here because I'm not a very good biologist and I'll leave it there. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That's really helpful, Kelly. Um, and I think this is, I think this is, these are great comments. And I think Brian and I could sort of go, go back and look and, and think about uh, ways to, I, I think that the combining the triennial makes it much more attractive to include um, if it's, if it's only one survey, it, when it's broken up, I think is when it, 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 it seems not as useful. Um, and I'll so chime. I, Chime in, Kiva. Yeah. That that's the general gist of of the chat as well. Um, okay. Kind of exploring that choice. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So that's it for surveys. Um, and then our last section is biological information. Um, so this is just a table of um, the data sources that we're going to use for the biological um, parameters in the stock assessment. So growth is going to be estimated internally using conditional age at length compositions from the trawl survey. Um, the length weight relationship is going to be fixed externally from the trawl survey data. Um, and then fecundity and maturity um, will likely use uh, the, the um, the fecundity will definitely use the same relationship as the last assessment, which was uh, UJ Dix meta analysis, and then the maturity data. Um, I, we might get some updated samples, but I don't expect um, any sort of major changes um, and will be used. Um, and then mortality, um, the last assessment used the Hamel prior, but that prior has been updated. So the value is going to be slightly different. Um, and then uh, we'll go into some of the sex specific stuff uh, further uh, later. Uh, so, uh, they, so canary rockfish have sexually dimorphic growth, so we'll model um, two sexes for growth. Um, there is a lack of old females across all data sources. So I'm going to show it for trawl survey data, but you should all know that it, uh, I want everyone to know that this is, it's not just a trawl survey issue. Um, and so it's sort of an issue for, both for this species and we'll talk about it again tomorrow with black rockfish. Um, since the last assessment, there was a master's thesis that identified a latitudinal break in life history a bit north of Coos Bay, Oregon. Um, and uh, so we have looked at possibly splitting growth there, but haven't actually seen estimate uh, evidence for it ourselves um, in the trawl survey data. Um, and then no major changes to maturity or fecundity. Um, and the previous assessment did have a maturity relationship that did account for skip spawning though. Uh, so I think the biggest sort of biological crux of the model is the lack of old females. Um, so you can see here's a plot from the, this data is from the trawl survey. Um, and so we see there's a lot of big females uh, that are high on the Y axis, but ever, all of the old fish are all male. Uh, and this is sort of a mystery and it appears in all data um, sources. This is another way to look at it. So here you're seeing the proportion by sex, a proportion female and male um, by length on the left. And we see that actually most of the largest fish are female. Um, but then on the right, where you see that by age, um, most of the oldest, all of the oldest fish are male. Um, and so, and again, this is seen across um, any, any type of fishing gear that you use. Um, the previous assessment fixed the natural mortality rate for males and young females using the Hamel prior um, and then estimated uh, and then and then set a ramp for female mortality from ages 6 to 14 and estimated an offset from the Hamel prior for females ages 14 and older. Um, this is uh, this was just sort of taken from previous assessments. Um, we sort of explored the history of these assumptions and none of them are super well grounded in anything. Um, and so we've been coordinating with the black rockfish assessment team, which sees a very similar pattern of a lack of old females. Um, and I think we're think leaning towards using a step function instead of a ramp um, because 
it requires fewer choices made by us that are somewhat arbitrary. Um, and then um, we'll also explore sensitivity to this assumption versus a dome-shaped selectivity. Um, uh, but, um, and I, and also the, the ramp from ages six to 14 was based on, um, I think, mature patterns in maturity, but we actually don't see a decline in females until closer to age 20. Um, so we'll likely explore different ages um, for that step function. Um, so this is related to the sort of, um, changes in life history, the latitudinal break in, the, in life history. So these northern ports um, were observed to have different life history traits um, than these southern ports. And it wasn't just growth, it was growth and uh, maturity and condition factor and mortality. Um, however, when we looked at the growth data, so I split um, the data at Coos Bay, the, the latitude of Coos Bay, and the triangles are southern samples and the circles are northern samples. This is all from the trawl survey. Um, and then you fit separate growth curves to the north and south data. You don't actually see a difference in these growth curves. So the um, the solid lines are northern growth are growth curve fit to the northern data and the dashed lines are a growth curve fit to the southern data. And so the, the sex differences are very pronounced, but the regional differences are not. Um, and so we're, uh, unless someone has, and so based on the data that we're seeing, um, which is a much larger sample size than was included in the master's thesis, um, we're leaning towards not splitting um, the, the growth latitudinally. Um, though that was hook and line sampling, and, and this is trawl survey sampling, the only difference. Um, so, um, questions about biological data. Uh, has anyone on this call magically found the stash of old canary rockfish females? Um, and then uh, any sort of thoughts towards the approach of modeling the lack of these old females? And is it more of an availability issue where we just don't know where they are or a mortality issue um, where the they're dying at a faster rate than the males? Um, and then also this um, issue of sort of latitudinal differences um, in, in growth. Um, and it was actually, it was not just growth. The study was was on many facets of life history. So it would have also applied to maturity and fecundity as well. But we haven't looked at that. Um, raised hands. Kelly, is this residual or do you have another comment? Sorry, it's old. Uh, Mark? Uh, yeah, we, I just want to, point out that um, we've been looking at age data going back uh, into the 90s, and we see this sort of lack of old females um, in a bunch of different species, blacks, canaries, and yellowtail. Um, where they're at, or we're, if they're even there, is a, a huge debate question, as uh, I'm sure you know. So um, I just want to point out that that the the trend of sort of the you know where are the boff um, we haven't seen them in a very long time. Yeah, thanks, Mark. <laughs> We're not aware of anyone who's found them either. <laughs> All right. Uh, Eva. I want to yeah. circle back. I was looking mm -hmm. through the chat and yeah. uh, I saw a chat from Dave Sampson about looking at the, I believe it was in regards to the, um, the trawl survey mm -hmm. and looking at how, looking at um, catches of canary where a lot of widow were caught. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dave, could you elaborate in terms of what that, that was would look for like? fishery that... dependent data? So that was for a discussion on, um, on whether to split up the midwater trawl fishery. And that huh. would be one, that would be one way to, I think, identify uh, historical midwater trawls. Okay. Yes, was the You're idea. right, Kiva, that's exactly what I was talking about. Thank 
Thank you, Kiva. Uh, John. Thanks, Kiva. Yeah, I'm just going to mention because I, I feel obliged to, and I've mentioned this to you already that um, the, the lack of larger, older females is always kind of bothered a lot of us because it is kind of inconsistent with the life history theory that we, we think rockfish should follow, and that with this considerably greater fecundity of larger, older fish, um, there's kind of a, it's a weird trade off to have them die off faster. Um, so I guess, you know, I don't have the solution. I know you don't either. I know there's a lot of talk. I'm very glad the stats are comparing a lot of notes. I know there's been talk about um, also exploring just sex specific natural mortality rates, which I recommend doing that too. I guess at the end of the day, just include as much uh, sensitivity as you can to justify your choice and, and eliminate folks as best you can about the trade-offs with respect to depletion. Because my recollection is that some pretty considerable differences in our perception of stock status when you did or did not include that um, increasing mortality from the last assessment. Yeah, I think it, it matters quite a bit and we have not a great way of differentiating between the options. Uh, any other final questions about anything that we have covered? And we did it in two hours, too. I'm not right. hearing much. I don't see hands or comments. Other than perhaps a residual John field comment, but, um. We thank you all for attending this meeting and providing input. Please feel free to reach out. Um, if you hear of things, uh, maybe old females have been found somewhere. Um, our emails are here. Uh, Marlene, I added them after sending you an update. So I, I may. Update our PDF so that our email addresses can be found on the slides and um, people can reach out if they need it. All right. Thank you, Brian and Kiva. I think um, this is the last presentation for today. Tomorrow we'll pick up with Black Rockfish. Uh, before we uh, call this part of the meeting to a close, um, just wanted to see if there were any public comments. I think folks had adequate opportunity to speak their piece during the course of the presentations, but I wanted to give a last chance for folks to speak to anything more generally or overarching, et cetera, that they had. Um, and we'll see if we have any hands that come up. Louis M. Well, hello, everybody. This has been very interesting. Canary rockfish is not really on my field, even though I did catch one 120 miles south of the uh, Mexican border. Um, John Field's point about the differential mortality of uh, uh, females and, and males is very interesting. And when we, we set a mortality for a species, yet we have such a different mortality between males and females, and also uh, have a lot more females than we have males, it, it makes for a, an interesting uh, problem. And I'm looking forward to hearing you look at this. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. Oh, Merritt McCray. Yeah, I'm not sure if you touched on copper. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you did earlier this morning when, when I wasn't on, but uh, I want to note that I, I did take a look at the standardizing of the the longer trips for the number of trips that were taken or that were observed, um, and so I appreciate that. And, and also, I'd like to add that I think it's important to actually standardize for space as well because is probably a substantial fraction of the habitat, which is uh, fished far less and accessed only by, well, primarily only by the uh, overnight fleet. I think there's one fleet of uh, 
Channel Islands area, three quarter day boats are able to get far up the uh, west side of the Channel Islands, and they actually access uh, some of those less fish areas on a three quarter day trip. But by and large, throughout the Southern California Bight, my sense is there's a lot of space and a, and a lot of habitat and a lot of the population that's only accessible by those those longer trips. Thanks, Merritt. Mark Freeman had your hand up. Yeah, I. So I remember back in the early 90s, and I don't know if it's the triennial survey, but um, uh, they have fishermen going out um, on the survey, and then they, they they listed a complaint that the survey was using nets from the 1950s and they were trawling too slowly. And uh, there was some uh, consternation um, amongst the NOAA fleet, but they finally changed their nets to modern nets. And, uh, and I think that was in the mid, mid to late 90s. So that could potentially be why they, uh, they have that break in there for the triennial survey because they had different equipment and different processes. Okay, so any other hands up? Thank you, Mark. All right, not seeing any new hands. Looks like these are residual. And so with that, I think we can call it a day for today. Thank you very much to the stats for the canary rockfish and copper rockfish. Tomorrow we'll hear about black rockfish, 9 a.m. And I hope to have as good a turnout as we had today. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, John, did you capture everything you needed from the SSE chair standpoint in terms of content note-taking or was that John Field? John Field was up for this one, and I think he has what he needed. He spoke to some things before we turned away from the Canary Rockfish okay. review. You're all good, John? You give the thumbs up? We've got I a lot of messy good. notes. I'll make sense of them and get them out to folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be making my own tomorrow for the Black Rockfish. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks, everyone. Anything else? Last minute. Uh, anything else, Marlene? Nope. I'll just reiterate. Nope. The thanks for everybody's um, participation today. Thanks a lot. See you tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.